are they able to have a seat at the table when it comes to making these decisions and, and, and you know, if we all have different lawyers and, and as part of this, how do the families play a role in what leads up to today? Well, how do families play a role? Let, let me start with how families play a role today because the statute requires that the judge uh, have a victim impact statement and the victim's families have a right to appear in court and speak. Um, in terms of putting cases together, uh, obviously we uh, often consult the family in terms of uh, who's going to be charged and what they're going to be charged with, but that's an administrative decision for the prosecutor's office. Uh, the families are, in that juncture, uh, witnesses. Uh, we try to be as sensitive as possible as we put these things together, but the legal obligation uh, that the system has to the victims comes into play now at sentencing, other than the obligation to make sure everybody knows step by step how the case is progressing and what's going to happen next. Uh, today when we hear, we're expecting to hear possibly from 17 people impacted by uh, what happened and then also possibly from the shooter himself. Chris, in your experience in the trials that you've been a part of in the past, it, is that a high, obviously we're dealing with an, a huge number of victims here. Um, do you expect to hear from all 17 of these people? Some, some say they may or may not, they wanted to make that decision. Does that sound like an appropriate number of people who will be talking today? Were you surprised to hear that many people would want to talk? Well, no, it, it's not surprising. The point is that uh, they all have an absolute right to speak, uh, and sometimes people, um, and many of the people in this case have said, what, what, what am I talking about? Um, the defendant's going to get life without parole, that's established, right. uh, and uh, my speaking isn't going to impact that. So, uh, as I believe it was Mr. Talley said, I'm not even going. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, with this many victims, you're going to have this many people who have the option to, and therefore take the option mm -hmm. to speak in sentencing. So uh, it's unusual based upon the, the, the hugeness of the victim uh, pool in this case, but uh, it, it's not unexpected. And there's also the possibility that the shooter himself could speak today, and you know we've heard that he might apologize to these families. Mm -hmm. Would that have any impact on anything moving forward? We know we have this federal court appearance that's taking place tomorrow. Would an apology today mean anything as we move forward in these proceedings? Well, that's the only, the only value of the apology is to impact the Attorney General's decision in regard to the death penalty. Mm. Uh, I don't know that Peyton Gendron is going to be able to change uh, his internal wiring uh, to uh, back away from his motives and back away from his intent here. Uh, and it's not going to matter in the state proceeding anyway. Uh, so anything he says uh, is self-aggrandizing at the best uh, and designed to impact the federal case in any event. Mm -hmm. We had so many conversations come out of that. Uh, I want to go back to talking about the systemic racism and how we got here. And days after, you know, the president comes to town and yep. it is a big to do. All eyes are on Buffalo for a racist incident, you know, and, and that's something that really hurts deeply with our community and it opened the door to difficult conversations and we were able to meet Dean Lewis and some of his co-workers who stopped by from Tesla and have such an important conversation about race and we want to let you listen to this our Ed Ranch asked Dean Lewis a really important question. Since May 14th what's changed for you as a black man in Buffalo? Truthfully not a lot um, it's still the same things you know, you're still looked at cross-eyed. You know, of course, when the incident first happened, everybody was much more open, much more relatable, so on and so forth. But as things go on, you know, if the conversations aren't being had like we talked about before. If it's not prevalent, then it's all the same, you know. So you still get, you know, the, the funny looks. You still get, you know, what are you doing here in this neighborhood? You know, things of that nature. What do you mean when you say when it's not prevalent? The reality of it is if there's nothing in front of people's faces, people have a tendency to turn a blind eye. People don't like to be held accountable, nor do they like to look in the mirror, you know? And we all have to do that. I have to do it, you know? And that's how you become a better person. That's how you become a person that people will look to you know, for advice or look to for help or whatever the case may be, or just for some comfort. Do you think that we have kind of reverted to how we were before May 14th as a community? In some respects, yes. 
Um, but in other respects, no, because there are people who are still afraid to come out of their houses. There are still pe that neighborhood is never going to be the same. You know, as far as I'm concerned, they should have never rebuilt that tops. They should have torn it to the ground. They should have raised it. And there was plenty of land in that area. Build a bigger tops. Why is there a tops, you know, over there built to handle 5,000 people, but it's a 20,000 person community? You know, this is ridiculous. Um, our neighborhoods don't get the attention that they should. You know, my wife and I drive through that area. We go, you know, to Tops over there. My mother lives over there. My daughter lives over there. My brother lives over there in that area. You know, two of my brothers and friends. You know, it's ridiculous. But we drive through there and you see so much desolation, you know, and it's not just there. You drive down Broadway, going towards the Broadway market so much desolation, so much just unused arid land that could be used, that could be brought to the forefront and made viable and make these neighborhoods what they once were. Now we met Dean outside of Tops the day the president came. Right. And in the days following the shooting, we were there every single day. You saw so many news outlets. It just across the street became wires and cables and trucks, all the networks coming in to take all of this in and, and put cameras and do interviews and things like that. But at the end of the day, this is a grocery store, a grocery store that is so important to this community. Mm -hmm. It's now back open. Things are different. It looks different. When you drive by there, friend, what goes through your mind? I mean, it's when you go to work, I, I'm sure it's, it's on the way. What goes through your mind? Well, I haven't been back in, in the store. Um, and I, I understand the perspective of both sides. Um, one, we don't have a grocery store in that neighborhood. So there, there really is no other option. Um, I, so I understand that perspective. Um, I personally believe that um, if the innovation and the passion to ensure that our community has access to banking, to uh, utility payment services and food, um, that in that moment there was international tension on Jefferson Avenue, mm -hmm. we could have done it. So my question is why? Why didn't we do it? Why weren't we prioritized? Um, why weren't, um, as, as they said, that this, this tops isn't even big enough for the neighborhood, right? So when are we going to bring community members to the table so that we can have a say in what our community truly looks like? Um, I, I personally believe that that top should have been torn down. A memorial site should have been built there. Um, I don't feel comfortable spiritually going back in there. Um, I, I walk past it every day. Mm -hmm. It is a constant reminder of how our community is disinvestment in it, um, the systemic challenges, the racial issues. To me, TOPS represents all that has plagued our community for decades. And we're not just talking about the events of May 14th. I'm talking about all the things that has happened to, to our people and to Jefferson Avenue and the east side in, um, in total mm -hmm. that's been happening to our community for, for decades. And TOPS represents that for me. Some people visited, it became a memorial site, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But some people who are from, born and raised in this area, stopped by there for the first time. You know, like this, it's such a siloed area. And this is something that the shooter looked into. He'd stopped by several times and scoped this area out and said, you know, I want to go to the black grocery store to, to mm -hmm. right into our community where people depend on, and you know, Deacon Patterson is driving people from church to go. Pearl Young is on her way back from a church service. This is a place that was so important to this community and it remains to this day, as you mentioned, people need this. And you saw the community really come together and support of those la in the weeks following, but you make a great point to talk about, you know, what happens now? Where is the investment? Right. Where do we go? Yeah. And I was, I was actually on my way to Tops when I got text messages and oh I seen Twitter. Um, and that was, that was a part of my regular routine mm -hmm. to go into Tops, grab something for breakfast, go to the office. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a deep, deep 
um, vacuum that's been left. Um, we talk about what healing looks like. Um, I'm not sure we'll ever heal mm. from this. Um, I appreciate that justice is being served, um, but in order for real justice to be served, we have to address the conditions that made tops on Jefferson the blackest place on a Saturday morning. And if we're not addressing what true economic and racial integration looks like in this community, we're not serving justice. Franchelle Parker from Open Buffalo joining us as, of course, we await the sentencing of the top shooter, Peyton Gentron, sent to be sentenced at 9.30 this morning. Our coverage began at 9, so we were able to kind of take a look back here. And we're going to keep you updated as we learn more from court. If you're just joining us, expecting to see live with Kelly and Ryan, we're waiting again for that sentencing to actually take place. But, Franchelle, you do mention, you know, that systemic racism, the thing that we need to start talking about early, early in children's lives mm -hmm. and continue to talk about as we all become adults. And in just the day after the shooting, I spoke with Zanette Everhart, whose son Zaire was in the parking lot. He was working at Tops when he was shot. He survived. And they have both since become such an advocate for education and change. And I want you to listen to what she said to me just days after what happened. This country is so afraid to talk about the true history of African Americans in this country. And that's the problem. We're not teaching it in our schools. Why? Why are we not? And I think that's the problem with this, what this man did. He's never been educated. He doesn't know. He doesn't know the true history of African Americans in this country. No one talks about it. We always just act like, you know, we, we start with slavery and then civil rights and that was it. Like, no, there's so much in between. There's so much in between and there's so much before. We have to talk about these things and we have to stop being afraid to educate our kids. This is, this is the year 2022. Kids still are not being taught African-American history in classrooms. Why? How is that even possible? So mm. I used to work with Zanetta years ago, and um, you know, since then, so much has happened, obviously. And, and just sitting there, hearing her talk about this, and I remember years ago when I worked with her, her son was young, maybe he was 10, 11 years old, and she would always come in you know, talking about him, and, and, and you know, her face would light up, as anyone's does when you talk about your children. And so let me ask you too, Franchelle, I know you mentioned you have children. What do you think about what she just said right now, about how we are not properly educating kids on the true history of African Americans and culture in schools? Um, <clears throat> well, I think we can, we can turn on the, any national news and see that there's an organized attack against the teaching of true civil rights, freedom, liberation, and African American history. Um, we, we, see it, we see it happening in Florida. We see it happening in other parts of the, the country. So yes, that's, that's, a, that's a real thing. We can't just concentrate a little bit of history in the month of February right. mm -hmm. and expect that true education and transformation can, can happen with our young people. But it has to start with our young people. We have to have conversations around not just someone getting resources over there, but all of our destinies and humanity are intertwined. Mm -hmm. And getting people to understand that by building up one part of the city, we're not taking resources from you. So having those conversations, building trust and relationships from a very young age. My, my children are four and two. Their, their daycare is right on Jefferson Avenue as well. So just thinking about the, the conditions of yeah. our children and how vulnerable they are. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a part of it and not waiting until college. Many of us say, you know, I had this awakening in college, right. but so much of our character, our integrity has already formed before we step on a college campus. And then it doesn't have to be an awakening because we grew up with it. And you know, Zanetta and Zaire then starting the book club too, where they're yeah. getting those books into the hands of children. It's something as simple as that. Reading a book about someone who is a little different to your own kids, mm -hmm. showing them that everybody is different and at the same time we're all the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. it, there's so many conversations that have to be had yeah. still. And, and Franchelle, when you speak about you know the attack going against that, and it, it's during Black History Month to have a discussion like that, it's just, 
it's eye-opening and I'm hoping that people have had these conversations in the past in the past nine months and not just this month but next month and, and the months after that now we are coming up with a little past 930 now and families are in the courtroom they're gathering now we have our crews in the courtroom going to give you that live coverage when that starts so we're waiting to hear from them but Chris I want to talk about what we're expecting to happen court was supposed to start at 930 we don't know what time exactly the judge will sit down but what are we expecting to see in the first moments once the judge does sit down on the bench and things get started? Well, the prosecution will stand and move the case for sentencing, uh, ministerial function. Uh, once the case is moved for sentencing, uh, the judge will turn to the defense and say, are you ready? Uh, the defense, of course, will be ready, um, would be hoped. And then uh, the judge would, uh, at that point, invite um, victim impact addresses to the court. Those would occur before the actual sentencing occurs. Uh, so uh, the district attorney's office will have uh, a general list um, to, to sort of the, the choreography of the moment, who's speaking first, who's speaking second, uh, and uh, those people will come to the well of the court, uh, the lectern there, they'll uh, approach the lectern with or without notes, and they'll say whatever they need to say. Uh, then the next person will, the next person will, the next person will, the next person will. That will be a time-consuming process. I read in the paper this morning one of the civil lawyers uh, said that uh, it's hoped that it'll get done today. Well, uh, I, I would hope it gets done today as well. Mm. Um, but uh, Ed Siri Adam, the, the folks will all uh, have their opportunity to speak, uh, and then the defendant will be given the opportunity to speak, uh, and then the judge will impose sentence. Now, we're just hearing that the prosecutors are walking in. Mm -hmm. uh, Police Commissioner Joe Gramalia has just walked in. The mayor, Byron Brown, is there. Mm -hmm. We're expecting to see a lot of people in right. this courtroom today. This coming from our crews who are in the courtroom right now. Ed Dranch is there. He's been there throughout the morning, now inside the courtroom. Eileen Buckley is there as well. They're going to be covering this for us throughout the day. We're also expecting to hear from the DA a little later. Leah Lando is going to give you that coverage. We're here with you all day through mm -hmm. this. This is a huge momentous day. Uh, we're talking about justice delivered mm -hmm. and we want to be f here with you every step of the way and really break down what's going to happen but also take a look back on all that we've talked about since then. You know Chris as Ed was joining us throughout the morning um, I actually noticed we joined him live from the court outside of the courtroom and there's so much security right now yeah. there. Part of the street is completely shut down. There's police dogs walking around. There were heavily armed uh, you know security guards, police officers. What does that say to you? You've covered so many and, or been a part of so many different trials. I mean, this, this has to be some of the um, tightest security that I've seen. What does that say to you as we're looking at this case? Well, it, it's interesting because uh, short of the uh, infamous 1990s Sly Green case where they actually had uh, snipers on the rooftops of the surrounding buildings, there has been no precedent for security to this level uh, in the Erie County Courthouse. But also interestingly, uh, the concern here is apparently not um, as much the security of the proceedings as it is the security of the defendant, I think. Hmm. Uh, because um, if the criminal justice system is to work, the defendant needs to be protected within it. Uh, no matter what Mr. Talley says, uh, it, that's an important component. Uh, so we have a situation here where um, the polarized world the two sides, if there are two sides, somebody could try to get to Peyton Gendron, uh, and that's the issue that the sheriff is trying to uh, cut down, and mm -hmm. the New York Office of Court Administration is trying to cut down on the exposure here, and that's why we tighten security. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, even part of the street is closed right now. Um, and, you know, it's just interesting when we see that because we don't see it, as you mentioned, often. And it's something else that I, I was wondering myself, and I'm sure other people are, he's being held at the Erie County Holding Center. Uh, will that change after today? Where would we expect him to go, or will that depend on what happens tomorrow as well? It will depend on tomorrow. I, I noticed John Elmore's comment in this regard. The federal public defenders, of course, will want access to their client. Uh, I'm sure the Sheriff's Department uh, in Erie County uh, would be very, very, very pleased if they could get the defendant transferred to state prison as soon as possible. Uh, they don't want responsibility uh, for him any longer than they need to have responsibility for him. Uh, what would normally happen if there wasn't a federal case kicking around mm -hmm. is uh, after he was sentenced, he'd be placed in a sheriff's car and he'd be driven to the state prison intake uh, center uh, and then he'd end up classified and go to state prison. Uh, given the fact that the federal proceeding exists, uh, the federal authorities 
uh, can what's called writ him to federal custody. Uh, and once he's in federal custody, then the U.S. Marshals determine where he's going to be. Uh, interestingly, again, many federal prisoners in <coughs> Western New York are kept in the National <coughs> County Jail. Mm. Uh, some are kept in other surrounding jails where there's space and the federal government pays rent to keep them there. Mm -hmm. uh, he could be kept in the Erie County Holding Center. Um, that's sort of an administrative unknown at this point. Uh, but uh, as I say, the, the federal proceeding complicates where he goes. Otherwise, he goes straight to state prison this afternoon. But no, not necessarily because of the federal proceeding. Right, and also because, as we mentioned, that security wherever he is is going to have to be top of the line. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's, that's uh, a long-term issue as well. Right. Um, I happen to see uh, some uh, pundits speculating that he'd eventually serve his time in Supermax in Colorado, a federal prison. Hmm. Not necessarily. Um, the state has a significant interest in meeting out justice, meeting out his sentence in state custody. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it becomes an issue uh, with his security, uh, that might be an administrative reason to transfer him to Supermax, uh, assuming he's convicted of federal crimes uh, after uh, that case goes through the system. And, th and there uh, would be a difference in the process. He'd be in a different prison. Interesting. All right. Well, as we continue to cover this morning, of course, the court um, was expected to begin at 9:30. Here we are at 9:38. You know, a couple mm -hmm. of minutes. You know, may um, be delayed. Of course, we have such a huge trial or huge sentencing happening today. And Taylor, you know, we were talking also about the days following the shooting and all of the things that happened and the memorial that popped up outside of the tops. And it was just so massive. It was ever growing. Mm -hmm. Each day you went, there was something new. There were balloons. Mm -hmm. There were flowers. Something would blow away. It would rain. Something would be right there to yeah. replace it. There were candles lit at night. It was really a beautiful memorial that was able to grow, but you know, things changed over time and now it's a part of history. Our, our James Cotato is going to help us go through where all those pieces with the flowers and the pictures are going to go after this. Sometimes life moves so quickly, it's easy to forget. One of the things that as a nation I think we're really good at is sort of pretending that everything is good and nothing happened or moving on from these horrific events and saying that it happened one time. But Lily Wiley Upshaw is not going to let the top shooting become a distant memory. We will always commemorate this, that we will be mindful and remember um, about this heinous act that happened in our city. What we all saw outside the Jefferson Avenue tops on May 14th, signs, letters, painted rocks, pictures, all of it in the Buffalo History Museum. No one wants to be documenting a trauma, but yet there's a responsibility to also understand what are the underpinnings that led up to something like this. Melissa Brown is the executive director of the museum, which has been collecting since 1862, but nothing like this. We often are collecting items that are representational of people's stories and people's lives, but this is very different. This all started when the Orlando County History Center reached out and did a Zoom with the Buffalo History Museum, walking them through what they found after the Pulse nightclub shooting that killed 49 people in 2016. We took everything. We took everything that we, that, you know, was put there as part of that. Realizing that those those types of items are there, they uh, they give you pause when you're encountering them and seeing these personal expressions of, of, of grief and, and caring. Brown says people will see this a lot differently, even six months from now. They're working with the victims' families. They want to have online access, 3D access, oral access through books. These are mementos that they'll continue to build upon so they can educate everyone in Buffalo and beyond. You can't, you know, read a chapter in a book and really understand the full color of any situation. And this is a huge opportunity for us to really open up some of the parts of our past that that we haven't talked about and really look at the framework for what positions us for a moment like this. So 50, 60 years from now, people will be able to go in and this terrible event that happened in our city won't be forgotten. So there you go. When you think about all of those things that were gathered outside of the tops in the days after that shooting, the days, the weeks after that shooting. And Franchelle, you and I were talking while that story was just playing. What would you like to see happen, A, with those things, but B, at the site itself? Um, many of us would just go out to the memorial site and think, 
pray, grieve. So I think it is important that some memorial, the mementos, the beautiful art mm -hmm. that is accessible to the neighborhood, making sure that it's not tucked away in a place that residents in the surrounding neighborhood can actually access. So that access is really important and having, having a beautiful space for people to grieve and pray and to think and to strategize is it's critically important. So my my hope is that something is developed. Um, I I actually I found peace going out and just looking at the art mm -hmm. and praying. So I hope that we ha we still have access to that and it's not just mm -hmm. a memorial inside of a museum. Yeah, you know, having reported here for years, it makes me think about what happened in the wake of the crash of Flight 3407 and how that site has now become a, more, a memorial and exactly what you're saying, a place for people to come, gather. There's a bench there. You can collect your thoughts. So that might be something that we would be seeing in the future. Of course, we know now all of these items that were collected there are at the History Museum right now. And there is work being done to create a permanent memorial, a spot like the 3407 Memorial where people can come to and, like you said, you know, pay their respects, pray, and grieve. And our Leah Lando did do a piece about this. I don't feel as though it's been properly mourned, grieved, memorialized. Franchelle Parker is the executive director of Open Buffalo. Her office is on Jefferson Avenue, just feet away from Tops. She was on her way to work on 514, and like so many other days, planned on stopping at Tops. Go to Tops, grab a donut, unsweet iced tea, and, um, and then uh, my sister asked me if I was at my office. And so that's how I was actually alerted that things were happening. I think about it every day. And she thinks about her two children who go to daycare just a block away. And that he had been to this community multiple times, including the day before. And my inability, even though they're a block away, my inability to protect them um, was, was a lot. It's a process. But she says she also felt hope when the spotlight was on Buffalo. Hope that as a community and a nation, we would work harder to fight racism and hate. But that hope faded fast. And then slowly, the cameras started to go away. The organization started to go away. Even the memorial outside of Tops. Now a committee is working to bring a permanent memorial to Buffalo so we never forget the 10 victims. Reverend Mark Blue is leading that commission. And we will uh, lay out a plan in which we will engage the community and look for an area and also look at cost of what it would take to build uh, the monument. He says a website will be established to allow people to stay up to date and share ideas. We want this to be something as a learning tool uh, for the whole world to see. I wanted to include an, an area to where people can come and reflect and also uh, leave there with hope. While Franchelle is all for a memorial, she doesn't know if she will ever step foot back inside Tops again. You can't go to Tops anymore, correct? I, I have not. I have not been to Tops. To have that level of um, bloodshed, that level of trauma and violence, and then to ask community members just to walk back through those same doors to purchase their bread. Um, I can't wrap my, my head around that. Yeah, so important that we keep talking about mm -hmm. those things. Frank, thank you for you know, being a part of that. It's, it's difficult to hear you know, that the place that you used to go to several times a day that you still walk by, you still can't go in. And I had been in there a couple times before but I still haven't been back. I was there the day it opened. I know I talked to the first customer that came out mm -hmm. and, and she said she's going to go back every day. She got herself something for dinner tonight. And, you know, I applaud people's bravery and I love to see people who feel comfortable to go back in. But I haven't been back in either. You know, the week that that happened, I didn't go to the grocery store, you know, until my last yeah. piece of cheese was there. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it's it's shaking to your core to, to know that something like this could happen in a place that you call home and to know that racism was the root of this. It was just so difficult and I was able to speak to the family of Pearl Young a couple days after um, outside of Tops and they spoke to me about uh, about Pearl and, and the person that she was but about what we've all been through and, and Pearl Young's daughter Pam Pritchett talked about racism being the root of, of what happened here today. I want you to listen to what she had to say. You know, I, I mentioned this to you in a conversation earlier. It's like we're marking, okay, it's five months, it's six months, it's seven months. It'll be a year, it'll be two years, it'll be three years, it'll be 10 years at some point. Mm -hmm. 
but the conversation has to come back to what the root cause was, and that's racism. Absolutely, and I think we have to be, that's why we have to be careful about always dating something, six months, seven months, because it takes away from the truth. The truth of the matter is this was a case, this was white supremacy, this was a person who believed that the color of his skin made him better than someone else. This was a issue where he believed in this whole idea of replacement theories and all of these things. And I think it is important that we keep at the root the reason why this person did what he did, the reason why he came to our city and came to that particular location was because he was looking to kill black people. He was looking to murder black people because of his racism and his hatred. And I'll say this, because this is something that really sticks with me a lot, Ed. I'm going to kind of pivot for yes. a minute. But it upsets me that people continue, continue to refer to this as a tragedy. Because when you do that, you take away the significance of what really happened. No, this was not just a tragedy. This was an act of racism, of white supremacy, and you have to call it what it is. You, you, we can't move forward like you were talking about. How can we as a community, we as a nation, we can't move forward if we can't call something by its name. And so you don't get to use words like tragedy to describe this because that's not what it is. I'm not saying that it wasn't tragic, but that's not the root cause of it. It's racism. And so when I listen to politicians and I see them use the word tragic all the time, I say to myself, you are so weak. You're, you're so weak because you're unwilling to call something what you know it is. This, this man had a manifesto. You, you, you don't get to get to be comfortable by calling it something that makes you a little more at ease. You have to be willing to call it what it is. It doesn't make you a white supremacist to call something white supremacy. It just makes you a person that's willing to use the word that truly describes what happened. Down to its core that day, mm -hmm. we, we saw racism. Not only was this planned out, not only was there a manifesto, but this was live streamed yeah. over the internet right. for people to see. Uh, and there were people watching and part of this, and, and there's video footage of, of what happened that day, which is wild to think about. Well, you know, and as we learned more and more about what was happening and what did happen, we learned not only is this root racism, it was also what was happening online and happening on the internet. And I'm getting word from our crews in the courtroom right now that things are beginning to take shape. Our producers, let me know if we do want to go to the courtroom right now. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and go to the courtroom. Let's talk about that afterwards though because we do wanna talk about the role that the internet played in all of this and, and how people are connecting online and what's being discussed. But we wanna take you live this morning if you're just joining us right now at 9.50 on the start of your Wednesday morning. This is the sentencing for 19-year-old Peyton Gendron, the top shooter who acted alone in that May 14th shooting, killing 10 people, injuring three others, targeting that at Tops on Jefferson Avenue, Taylor, because he knew that black people would be shopping there. Live streaming his attack had a camera mounted on his helmet. That attack took place within two minutes, killed 10 people, injured three others. You can see him walking the into the courtroom right now. We will take him live the as the judge custody, takes your seat. And we are here today for purposes of sentencing. Before we get started, I would like to note for the record that I have received numerous media requests regarding the coverage of this case. I have issued an order allowing for a pool camera to video and audio record this proceeding and live stream the proceeding. Our local CBS news affiliate WIVB has been designated as that pool camera. There will also be a designated pool still photographer here from the Buffalo News. Please be advised that no other individuals or entities have been approved or are permitted to record this proceeding in any way. And I would ask all spectators to silence their cell phones and um, refrain from using their cell phones during this proceeding. Both the Buffalo News and WIVB are prepared to share the images and footage that they have captured. 
No photos, video, or live stream footage may be taken of those sitting in the gallery. Additionally, not all of the victims that wish to speak here today wish to be on video, and I will identify those individuals uh, to the media, and I would ask that no videos or still photos be taken of those individuals. I trust that you will honor the order of this court and the wishes of these victims. Additionally, part 22 on the fourth floor will be available following this proceeding for the press to gather uh, for any statements from the parties. Is council uh, ready to proceed in this matter? Yes, Your Honor. All right, I would just ask that all council enter their appearance on the record starting with the people. Sure. John Carolino for the people. Justin Caldwell for the people. Gary Hackers for the people. No, I only get for the people. Brian Haggerty for the people. Thank you. Robert Cunning for Peyton Gendron. Dan Dubois on behalf of Mr. Gendron. Brian Parker on behalf of Mr. Gendron. Thank you. The people have indicated that they are ready to proceed. Is the defense ready to proceed? We are. Mr. Fairlock. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the people did receive a copy of the pre-sentence investigation report. Can we you use the microphone, Mr. Yes. Fairlock? Uh, the people have received a copy of the pre-sentence investigation report. Uh, we find no errors or omissions. Uh, today, we anticipate that the court will hear from uh, the following people. Uh, on behalf of Erin Salter, uh, Kimberly Salter. Uh, she had previously advised that she did not wish to be video recorded, although I have been informed by our victim advocate that she has changed her mind and she is okay uh, with her statements being video recorded. On behalf of Celestine Cheney, Wayne Jones, on behalf of Roberta Drury, Leslie Van Giesen. On behalf of Andre McNeil, Deja Brown, and Vian Elliott. On behalf of Catherine Massey, Damone Maps, Demetrius Massey, and Adrian, I'm sorry, Adrian Massey and Barbara Maps. On behalf of Mangus Morrison and Pro Young, Michelle Spite. On behalf of Ruth Whitfield, uh, Simone Crowley, and Sasha Crowley. On behalf of Geraldine Talley, Brian Talley and Tamika Harper. On behalf of Jennifer Warrington, Stephanie Waters. On behalf of Zaire Goodman, uh, Zanita Everhart. And Christopher Braden will speak on his own behalf. After the court hears from those individuals, Assistant District Attorney Justin Caldwell will address uh, the court with comments on behalf of the District Attorney's Office. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Mr. Farrelletto, given your comments um, concerning Ms. Salter, uh, to your knowledge, are there any of the victims that will speak today that do not wish to be videotaped? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. And um, you would ask that they come forward before uh, Mr. Caldwell speaks? Is that what you said? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So, at, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, any um, victims that wish to come forward to speak to the court, you may come forward, and I would ask that you um, process up to the podium along this side of the courtroom, my right, your left, um, and that all of the victims remain on this side of the courtroom and not approach um, from the other side. So, uh, at this time, I would leave it to the, the DA's office. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kimberly Salter, and I stand here this morning on behalf, on behalf and with my husband, Aaron Salter. My family and I are here this morning, and we wear red and black. Red for the blood that he shed for his family and for his community, and black because we are still grieving. Today I share with you, as it is written in God's word, you will reap what you sow, more than you sow, later than you sow. It is your choice. God is love, and he offers love to each and every one of us. It is written in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I will also read Psalm 35. The Lord, the avenger of his people, a Psalm of David. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear and stop those who pursue, who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those who put to shame, let those be put to shame who bro and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly and let his net that he has hidden catch himself into that very destruction, let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say. Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders them. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer will return to my, my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bow down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly markers at feasts, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. Let them not rejoice over me, who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause, for they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful matters. Against the quiet ones in the land, they also open their mouths wide against me and said, aha, our eyes have seen it. This you have seen, O Lord, do not keep silence. O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication to my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, in their hearts, ah, so we would have it. Let them not say we have swallowed them up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant? 
and my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. And so it is. This is the reading from God's word. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sullivan. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. I'm here on the behalf of the grandchildren of Ruth Elizabeth Whitfield, Tiffany, Camila, Jasmine, Felicia, myself, Simone, Garnell III, and Sasha. Our grandmother, our grandmother went to buy seeds for her garden on May 14th, 2022. She may not have been able to plant those seeds but the seeds that she planted throughout her life are abundant. The same way she brought us together on Rich Street is the same way she brought unity and solidarity to the masses. We fondly remember waking up from our sleepovers to the smell of Sunday dinner while getting ready for church. She was the driving force for our fishing trips and our camping adventures. Our grandmother had a strong and resilient spirit. She will not be present for our milestones, but we stand strong and determined and triumphant in ways that you could never fathom. We find strength in knowing that her legacy will outlive you. You will simply go from a name to a number. You will be herded like cattle. You will be shut away from the world. You will not enjoy family events. You will not enjoy outings with friends. You will be nameless and faceless, and we feel sorry for you. We pity you even. Your life was meaningless before May 14th, 2022, and you woke up every day feeling small. You clearly did not value your own life, which allowed you to devalue the lives of others. Even with all of the heartache that you have caused, you still have failed to break our family spirit. You thought you broke us, but you awoke us. We all know the pure hatred and motivations behind your heinous crime, and we are here to tell you that you failed. We will continue to elevate and be everything that you are not, everything that you hate, and everything that you intended to destroy. Despite our battle scars, we will not, you will not, win the war. We had a praying grandmother who taught us that the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. The global outpouring of support and love, not only for our family, but for everyone within the black community has spoken volumes, and it reiterates your failure. You are a cowardly racist. Every single person that has been instrumental in molding you and supporting you and informing you, aiding and supplying weapons needs to be held accountable and not protected as they have been. You recorded the last moments of our loved ones' lives to garner support for your hateful cause, but you immortalized them instead. We are extremely aware that you are not a lone wolf, but a pawn of a larger organized network of domestic terrorists. And to that network we say, we as a people are unbreakable. Our dear grandmother, our dear grandmother, Ruth Elizabeth Whitfield, she taught us the power of love. And even in our darkest hour, we will ensure that her legacy will be that of love. Thank you. I, I'm sorry for your loss. It is, it's not necessary for those who wish to speak to stand uh, waiting for your turn. We will wait for you to approach the podium. So if you would like to take a seat um, and be more comfortable, you're welcome to do so. Wayne Jones, only child of Celestine Cheney. I watched you kill my mom. I watched you on the internet. I watched you shoot her once. 
reload, and shoot her again. I just want you to remember that name and what you did. On March 14th, you killed Celestine Cheney, Rabita Dury, Andrew McAuley, Kathleen Mosley, Markel, Marcus Morrison, Haywood Patterson, Andrew Saunders, Geraldine Talley, Ruth Winfield, and Pearl Young. These are the names of the victims you decided to kill that day. Here are some of the names of the, the lives you've changed forever. Wayne Jones Sr., Wayne Jones Jr., Kayla Jones, Sharon Reed, Shana Jones, Donnell Jones, Nasir Jones. You took from us a loving mother, grandmother, sister, aunt, cousin, and friends. Behind your senseless act, we will never have another birthday another get-together, another celebration, me and her shopping, another call on the phone like we often like to do. While I was writing this, tears fell from my eyes. Thinking about what a beautiful person you took. hate, which you've learned from the internet. I'm not going to drag this out long. I just want to remember some of the things that, I want you to remember some of the things that I've said to you. I've seen you a couple times in court, and you look like a young man that could be anybody's son. You don't come across to me as a racist killer, even though that's what you have done. Mistakes, some are big, and some are small. This one here is a real big one that you can't take back. You have to live with this one, bro, just as I have to live with this every day. I don't know what you're relationship with your parents are. But I'm a parent, and I feel sorry for your parents. You will never get to hug them again, like I won't. You will never get to see your grandparents again. You will never see the outside world again. I don't wish the death penalty on you. I wish they keep you alive. So you have to suffer with the thought of what you did for the rest of your life. <laughs> to me, killing you is the easy way out. One day, I hope you find it in your heart to apologize to those 10 families who you've shattered their lives for some <laughs> senseless, unnecessary business that you had going on with yourself. You have shattered a lot of lives here, son. I got a child your age. I know it was a mistake. It was a big one, bro. You're going to pay for this. Just find it in your heart to apologize to these people, man. I've been there, man. You've been brainwashed. The internet is the issue. They bring, you're only 18. You can, obviously, you couldn't hate. You don't even know black people that much to hate them. You learned this on the internet, and it's a big mistake. I feel sorry for your mother, your mother. I don't have mine, but your mother, she's dying inside for what you've done. She can't even pick her head up behind some nonsense that you've done. And I hope you find that in your heart. 
to apologize to these people, man. You did wrong for no reason. That's all I gotta say. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I'm sorry for your loss. Good morning. Your Honor, my name is Leslie Van Giesen. I represent Roberta Jory's family. My daughter, Robbie Drury, was a young woman. She was not married. She had no children. She never will. Robbie was our youngest daughter. When people ask, how many children do you have? I don't know what to say. Will I ever be able to enjoy August 11th? her birthday, May 14th. How will my family ever have a nice thought on a beautiful spring day? How do I look at her Christmas stocking hanging every year? Today, when I think of Robbie, I don't think of her like this. I need this picture to remind me. She was a beautiful girl. I think of her alone, laying on the pavement for hours. I've never been able to see or touch her after that day. I have been profoundly changed. My life view is it's just saddened everything. Robbie's family, my family, has been permanently damaged and there is no punishment that will ever reserve, reverse our loss. Thank you. Thank you, Liz Van Giesen. I'm very sorry for your loss. Good morning. My name is Tamika. I'm the niece of Geraldine Talley. Our family's aunts are more or less our second moms. And that's what you took away from me. You took away my mom, best friend. You destroy our lives forever. It's not a day that goes by that I won't remember May 14th and being Two minutes sooner, I could have been in that store. And all I think about is, could I have saved my aunt? Could I have helped her get away from the bullets? Or could my mom be suffering more and lose her daughter, her granddaughter, and her sister? So in life, everything that happens, happens for a reason. And that's good and bad. At 18, at 19 years old, I had to bury my first son. But the pain I feel from you taking my aunt from our family will never even compare to burying my own child. This was the, a horrible crime that you committed. And I hope you do pray for forgiveness. Because you know, not forgiving, <laughs> I will be blocking my own blessings. So do I hate you? No. Do I want you to die? No. I want you to stay alive. I want you to think about this every day of your life. Every day of your life, think about 
my family and the other nine families that you've destroyed forever, forever. May 14th will never be the same for me. My aunt was my grandchildren's godmother, and she was taken away on my granddaughter's birthday. My granddaughter will never be able to celebrate her birthday on May 14th. It hurts so bad. It hurts so bad. But I'm going to pray for you. And I want everyone to just pray for all the families that we can get through this. Because right now, almost a year later, I still feel like my life will never be the same, ever. It will never be the same. Thank you. I'm sorry for your loss. My name is Barbara Massey. I'm Catherine Massey's sister. You killed my sister. Cat, I'm going to tell you about my sister, Cat. Cat weighed 110 pounds, 72 years old. Cat would do anything for anybody, anytime. Cat was intelligent. She was a teacher. She was my best friend. She was anything at any given time. Cat was a protector. If Cat saw you, she probably went in her pocket and gave you some money, even though you didn't need it. Cat was an aunt. She was a great aunt. She was a cousin. She was a friend. Cat said she was a committee of one. There's nothing Cat wouldn't do for people. I want personally to choke you and leave my fingerprints on your neck because it was unnecessary. You leave 200 miles to come to Buffalo. You don't even know any black people. 95.7, that's what they said for the citizens in your time. You don't know an Indian, a Mexican, nobody. And your little punk ass decided to come and kill my sister. I talk to Cat every single day. You know, make you a happy kid. Cat didn't have any children, but she said she had 34,000. That was the number of kids in school. Cat had so many children, our mind went boom with her own money. There's nothing Cat wouldn't do for anybody. You know what made Cat happy? Us cutting grass that we don't even own. That made my sister happy. That's what I was doing when you killed Cat. I was doing her lawn. I was there eight hours with my family, banging the cops. Is my sister OK? You blew off her fucking back of her head, man. You OK? 110 pounds, 72 years old. I want to, you better stick those places. You better say, cop, thank y'all for protecting me, because I will hurt you so bad. You have made me sick. You got my family crying. I miss my sister every day. I live three doors down from Cat. I talk to Cat four times a day. My brother Ward goes up there and sit in the park with Cat like to be. My son called Cat triple black because she was so proud of her heritage. My nephew said, Cat, was a saint among sinners. My sister, Catherine Vassie, was a great person. Cat didn't hurt anybody. None of these families did. You're going to come to our city and decide you don't like black people. Man, you don't know a damn thing about black people. We're human. We like our kids to go to good schools. We love our kids. We never go in no neighborhoods and take people out. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're watching right now the sentencing. Obviously, emotions are running very, very high in that courtroom as Peyton Gendron is set to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of, of parole. And you just heard from Barbara Massey, that was Catherine Massey's sister. I mean, yeah. you can't imagine the emotions that people are going through right now. I mean, it's difficult for all of us sitting here watching this and to know what's happening right now. Um, we have Chris Belling with us here. Chris, you know, you worked with the DA's office for so many years. Talk to us about what you're thinking as you see what's unfolding in the courtroom right now. Well, it's obviously, uh, uh, if I can say, a macrocosm of my career. I mean, I mm -hmm. uh, worked on many, many cases. I worked on multiple victim cases. I, um, you know, 
was chief of homicide the year that Buffalo had 94 homicides mm -hmm. in one year. Right. Uh, we haven't had that in, in many years. But uh, this case is so massive in and of itself uh, that it uh, causes uh, the emotions to run wild. I, I, on the video note, one of the defense lawyers is crying in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe the judge has come off the bench, and we're going to take you right back to the courtroom um, as things get to settle down here, because we have a lot more victims, families, members to hear from, so we'll take you back live to the courtroom now. Now you can hear the emotion in this room. You can hear people sobbing. Our crews that are in that room say all the family members are sobbing. Um, they're a little bit upset, mm -hmm. obviously, about what's happened there. And you can see the tensions rose. And, and he's being protected mm -hmm. by security. There's a lot of security. The streets are blocked off. It, it's a right. difficult situation out there. You know, and Chris, you were just saying um, this this is the culmination of so much and and there are so many emotions in that courtroom right now and you can understand too how people are feeling looking at someone who they know took the lives of one of their loved ones um, you know they're not alone in the way that they're feeling it, it, it's, it has to be difficult to stand there and, and and confront the person who you know killed someone you loved right and it, it is much much more difficult in these circumstances um, this is the, the unusual case where uh, the motive has been identified and the motive is racism. And that right. makes it all the more worse mm -hmm. uh, for the families here. Uh, other homicides are completely different than this particular case, mm -hmm. uh, and the law recognizes that, obviously. Uh, but um, it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. I noticed that the, the court officers anticipated what was going to happen, and they yes. moved an officer in front of Gendron at the uh, moments before uh, whoever that was lunged at him, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they have a, a difficult job too. They're mm -hmm. they're in a situation where uh, maybe they want the guy to get together. I don't know, uh, but their obligation and the justice factor here is that that doesn't happen. Uh, so um, very 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 unusual case, and uh, right. uh, we're, we're sort of. Uh, spectating at it right. uh, as it unfolds. Yeah, now Gendron was rushed out of the court um, by some of the people in there, but before that, when um, Geraldine Talley's niece, Tamika, was speaking, the camera panned over to him and you could see his face is red and he's sobbing. Fran, what goes through your mind when you see him, people speaking directly to him and he's sitting there sobbing in tears? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I I think for a moment how many it's 19 right how right. many people in his life has failed him from family to teachers to community leaders I don't know if he played sports mm -hmm. how many people have come in contact with him that never that he was able to spend more time online, in chat rooms, developing relationships with other white supremacists as opposed to people in his own community. Mm -hmm. um, so we really have to start to address racism as a humanitarian crisis. And the same way that we come together during national disasters and earthquakes and tornadoes to really start addressing what, because we we stand to lose an entire generation. And we see that it, it is a crisis happening with young white men. Mm -hmm. And developing a strategy to bring them back and to develop relationships. I'm, I'm looking at them. I don't. I don't know if this is a tactic in right. order to not get the death penalty, or if something in his heart is 
shifting. I, I, I just don't, I don't know. Yeah, and you know what, it's one of those things we, we may never know the answer to that, which mm -hmm. is such a difficult thing to say. You know, and, and if you're just joining us now live here at 1026 on your Wednesday, uh, we are watching the sentencing of Peyton Jenner and the top shooter and emotions, just live, raw emotions happening in that courtroom right now as people impacted by this shooting are speaking out and talking about their loved ones and face to face with the person who they know killed him. So he was rushed by someone in the crowd. He was in turn rushed out of the room, out of the courtroom. And Chris, have you seen something like this happen before? And what will be the process as we move forward? We're kind of in a little bit of a holding pattern here. I'm assuming as we wait for emotions to kind of die down. Yeah, it's emotions to die, die down. Right now the, the victim witness people in the DA's office are undoubtedly assembling the remaining victims families and saying look uh, you can't do that um, somebody crossed the line and now the proceeding is slowed down uh, and you want this proceeding to continue uh, we have to abide by the rules uh, so those people are at this point probably triaging the situation with all those victims families saying we've got to do what justice demands, but you can't do anything that's going to step over the line because you're going to end up possibly getting arrested yourself and certainly delaying this proceeding, which is what nobody wants. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, I've seen people shout out in the courtroom. I've seen uh, things happen. I've seen people charge other people in the courtroom. But uh, this situation, again, uh, the magnitude is, is so much greater, uh, but the rules are still exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, the, the prosecution staff has to get the people under control to whatever degree is possible uh, and uh, until that happens and the court is assured that they're going to be able to go forward the judge will stay off the bench and the defendant will stay back in the uh, holding cell. Uh -huh. and, and, and we know, you know, this is this is a, such a difficult situation. We know those emotions are running high. You know, we have crews in the courtroom right now and, and they're telling me, Ed Dranch there, saying there's just sobbing in the courtroom right now. Um, Zanetta, one of the mothers of a victim, Zaire, who did live and, um, you know, is there as well, just sobbing, um, you know, talking about how, how this um, shooter was then rushed from the courtroom. So. You know, the emotions are high. We're going to wait and see as these court proceedings will continue. But, you know, Taylor, it's just a difficult situation. Again, these families facing yeah. a person who killed their loved ones. We've heard from six of the 17 people we're supposed to hear from today. There's so much still that's left to be said and so many more emotions that are going to come up in this courtroom. So while we're in this holding pattern, I just want to go through some of the, the words that I heard that struck me today. Um, Ruth Whitfield's granddaughter saying, you thought you broke us, but you awoke us. Mm. You failed. Um, we will win this war through the battle scars. I mean, hearing the pain in her voice when she talked about her grandmother, just saying her name mm -hmm. brought tears, brought emotions to, to all of us sitting here, and, and you can hear everyone in the courtroom. And then when Wayne Jones, Celestine Cheney's son, talked about his mom, you know, he, he talked about forgiving him and, and being at a different place now, but talking about what Peyton Gendron has done to his own mother and his own family, some of these words, some of the, the, directly to him, getting that chance to stand up and right. speak to him today, all right. it's some of the most powerful things that I've ever, ever heard. Okay. And you hear the, the court officer saying, all rise, yes. the judge making Thank her you. way back to the bench now. Please so we do want to take you live back to the courtroom. During this proceeding uh, is an opportunity for those of you who are most affected by this um, heinous act to address the court and address the defendant. But I am sure that you are all disturbed by <clears throat> the physicality that we've seen in the courtroom here today. And, and I understand that emotion and I understand the anger but we cannot have that in the courtroom. And I am prepared to give anyone that needs to speak an opportunity to speak. Um, and I know that you need to address some of your comments to the defendant, but we must conduct ourselves appropriately because we are all better than that. And so we will continue with the proceeding at this time. And anyone that is feeling overwhelmed by their emotions, I would ask that you perhaps step out in the hallway and take a moment to gather yourself. But we are here today to allow you to express yourself and I will allow you to do that, but I need you to stay at the podium. 
we can bring the defendant in, please. The record will reflect that the defendant is uh, present in the courtroom and we are ready to proceed. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Zanetta Everhart and I am here on behalf of my son, Zaire Goodman. On May 14, 2022, my son Zaire Goodman was at work doing what young people do. He was working at his part-time job and then terror struck. A terrorist shot Zaire point blank in the neck and the bullet fragments tore through his body and exited his back. He miraculously survived, but his life is now forever changed. Over the last several months, his life has been all about going to the doctor, seeing therapists, and trying to make peace with knowing that someone came into his community and tried to kill him because of the color of his skin. And then questioning why his life was spared when 10 others did not survive. It is an understatement to say that he has survivor's guilt. He is dealing with the pain that I, as a mother, cannot heal. The ideology to which this terrorist carried out this attack by some is labeled as a sickness or a disease. It is not. Racism, hatred, and white supremacy are lifestyles that are chosen. On that day, Zaire chose to get up and go to work. And that terrorist chose to drive a few hundred miles to shoot and kill 10 people and seriously injure three others. As humans, we have the ability to decipher right from wrong and make choices accordingly. No matter what choice we make, we have to deal with the consequences of that choice, good, bad, or indifferent. On that day, this terrorist made the choice that the value of a black human meant nothing to him. The disregard he has for human life and the callousness to which he carried out this attack on my son and my community not only makes him a monster, but a coward. Only a hu weak human takes out their pain on others. The world says you have to forgive in order to move on. But I stand before you today to say that will never happen. Forgiveness to me puts this tragedy in the laps of the victims, and I nor my son will accept the responsibility of his terroristic act. This is his and his alone. It is he who will need to ask for forgiveness. As he lay in his cell late at night, when he can't sleep. I hope that he is thinking of the 10 lives that he stole from us. I want him to think about my son, who he shot, and the other survivors. I want him to think about the community he tried to destroy. And when the sun comes up, I want him to know that that is Zaire. That is my son, Zaire, my son Goodman, showing you that what you did to him hurt, but he continues to shine. Whatever the sentence is that he receives, it will never be enough to pay for the damage that he has caused. I hope that he receives the fate that he deserves. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Stephanie. On May 14th at 11 a.m., I was on a Zoom with the group I've been in for years called Erase. Our slogan is Eracism. We seek through person-to-person -person communication to eradicate the disease of racism and white supremacy. A few hours after my Zoom ended, I called my sister to visit with her. She answered the phone. She said, Steph, I'm in an ambulance. I've been shot in the head. 
If I die, please be there for my children. A lot of people have been killed. Please ask everyone that we know to pray. I begged her to stay on the phone, not knowing if I would ever speak to her again. She hung up and I headed to the airport. It wasn't until I was sitting in the airport, in the plane, that my nephew called and said, Aunt Steph, it was a white supremacist. He filmed the entire thing on live stream. I groaned and roared and screamed so loudly that the plane was delayed in taking off. I roared in pain for my sister, my beautiful sister, pharmacist who was serving in the east side. I never knew if I would see her again. I roared also in pain for my brothers and sisters who do not look like me or like the defendant. I roared in pain because he bought into the lies of this country that somehow, because of the amount of the chemical in our skin, we are superior. We were not even the first ones here in the US. Okay? Our black and brown brothers and sisters endured centuries, not years, centuries of oppression as they built our buildings and produced our crops by which the foundation of this country was built on. They continue to endure oppression. Even the Harvard lawyer is mistaken continually in the courtroom for the defendant and not the, not the lawyer. They continue to endure microaggressions. They continue to have their families gunned down simply because of the color of their skin. You heard some of the family members today reading from the Bible, offering forgiveness, offering peace, showing the beauty of their hearts. Yes, you also saw the fury. And for those who serve, who I have to ask people to sit, I ask you to do it with an empathy in your heart and an understanding that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we have been looking at our brown brothers and sisters as if they were less than. They are not less than. They deserve our respect. They deserve our radical empathy. They deserve for us to get educated on what we can do to treat them with the respect that they deserve. I'm speaking not only for my sister who served in the East Side. My mother's not with me. She's a teacher on the East Side. She's teaching today. Our father, my late father, was a cancer research scientist, master's and a PhD. He dedicated his life to serving. For the last 30 years on the East Side, he ran a mission helping people that deserve to be here, that deserve to be helped. So I ask you, Judge, I wish you could promise that the defendant would never have access to social media for the time that he's alive. I know that's not practical, but I would ask you, the defendant, please, please consider the possibility that you were wrong and that we are stronger together. Diversity makes us beautiful. If every color in the palette was the same color, we would have no beauty in anything in this world. Diversity in the body makes us strong. If every finger was a pinky, we couldn't do anything. We are stronger together. A house divided cannot stand. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Christopher Braden. It has been less than a year since you attacked me and 12 others that day, along with countless numbers of TOPS employees, customers, and residents of that area. I still remember May 14th, 2022, and everything about it still haunts me. Your actions have completely changed and impacted my life in every aspect. I cannot even begin to feel, describe the feeling of terror I had on that Saturday afternoon when I was attacked by you. I was shot in the leg, um, I was shot on the inside of my leg just above my knee and the bullet exited outside below my knee, taking almost everything with it. Uh, the injuries I sustained were severe, but I remained conscious and coherent the entire time. I unfortunately saw a few victims being killed. As I was being taken out of the store after the shooting was over, I saw all the victims where they lay. The visions haunt me in my sleep every night and most days. I cannot get those memories out of my head. Nighttime is the worst for my PTSD. I have night terrors that jerk me awake in the middle of the night, and I'm unable to calm back down to go back to sleep. Loud noises never modeled me before, but they do now. 
I am always on edge and hypervigilant about my surroundings, feeling the need to be always on alert and protect myself. I spent 10 days in the hospital, endured four surgeries with two more surgeries to go. My left leg below my knee was nearly lost had it not been for the excellent work of my surgeons and the entire team at ECMC. It takes me at least 15 minutes every morning just to get out of bed because my left leg and foot don't work as they should. Without the brace on my foot, it drags and I am not able to flex it. I have no feeling from my knee down to my toe. Both of these things are permanent. I just started being able to put my own sock on and shoe, although some shoes I still have trouble with. I am frustrated with the things that I haven't been able to do since my injury. I could speak for hours about my injuries and treatment, as well as the permanency of these injuries. The stress of not being able to return to work, the pain I suffered hospitalized that continues to this day, um, extensive rehab I have gone through. However, I would rather talk about being a survivor. I'm still the same person that I was before you did this to me. My scars and pain remind me of how strong I've become. I am more alive and stronger than ever. You haven't taken away my will to live. You haven't broken my spirit. The scars are a constant reminder of what happened to me, but don't define my future. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Brian Talley. I'm here on behalf of Geraldine Talley and my nephew, Mark Talley. Um, Peyton Gendron. Peyton Gendron. The reason I mention your name is because so many people have spoke about it not to say anything, not to mention your name. But you need to be known. You need to be known worldwide. I've done a little history on you too, Peyton. Um, I watched the video, you know, and I just can't believe what can you say, what can you possibly say after putting on a video of killing people? It was like a video game to you. What can you possibly say to anybody? Your words don't mean anything. After this, I'm leaving because I don't want to hear what you have to say. It doesn't make a difference. I'm going to give you a little history lesson. The Willie Lynch doctrine, the making of a slave, it said you take the biggest, the toughest, and the blackest near. You take them. You tie a horse to one arm. You tie a horse to the other arm. You tie a horse to one leg and tie a horse to the other leg. And then you rip them apart in front of every slave to let you know what it is. You did that to us. You came into the biggest part, the strongest part of the black community, and you ripped us apart. How can you possibly get any kind of, how can you possibly stand up here and say that you're sorry? That you're sorry, you're playing this whole thing. You planned it, you put it on a video, like it was a video game and watched it. I watched my sister-in-law get shot by you. I watched it. I went in the tops a couple of times and every time I go in there, only thing plays out in my mind is where you walked, where you shot, what you did. You know, the hatred that you must have in your heart for black people, I will never understand. I don't want to understand it. But I must say this. I pray to God they do not kill you. Because I've been incarcerated. You know, I have. And I know where you're going. Where you're going, solitary confinement for the rest of your life by yourself. Wearing this color green, that's why I wore green today. Because I want you to remember this color. You're going to be wearing this color for the rest of your life. I'm praying that you wear this for the rest of your life. I will say this. My nephew didn't come today because of the hate and the pain that he feel. And I don't blame him. I do not blame him because he's still hurting. This whole community is hurting, man. You know, you broke it. You, you divided this community so much that it's... It's painful. We'll never heal for this. Can you imagine? You wake up on a Sunday morning, and you're going shopping, and you're going shopping on a graveyard? Because that's what Tops is now, it's a graveyard. Huh? It is a graveyard. 
Can you imagine going to buy your grocery at Forest Lawn, right in the middle of Forest Lawn right now? Well, that's what you did. And if you look at the community right now on Jefferson Avenue, after all the hype and everything, nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, it's got even worse. It's got even worse. Stores is closed down. The community is totally devastated. And you did this. I, I pray to God for your soul. I forgive you. But I forgive you not for your sake, but for mine and for this black community. I forgive you. Because that's the only way we're going to heal. But you can best believe, I will never forget your name. I will follow you, every, every your parole, whenever you're, whatever you're going through, I'm going to follow you, just like you followed us, just like you sat down and you followed us. I will always remember your face. I will never, ever forget you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Michelle. My last name is Spite. I lost an aunt on May 14th and a cousin. What are the chances that two of your family members would be in the same place from two different sides of your family? This is the first time I really had to process this for myself as I've been an advocate for my families that couldn't be as strong to speak for themselves. The calculated manifesto that you derived, the way that you started on a street that I grew up on. You journeyed down my grandmother's street and then wound up at Tops and killed two of my family members. My cousin Pamela Young, that was, Pearl Young was her mother. She was her only daughter. So I stand here to represent James Young, her son, Damon Young, her son, Pamela Young, her daughter, and all of her grandchildren, Oriana, Greg, Nate, and a host of others. I'm going to read Pamela's statement. She could not be here today. It's entitled Residency. What will take up residency? Will it be May 14th, 2022? or the court appearance, or every interview, or every time I've had to send my mother's death certificate to an insurance company with the cause of death being multiple gunshot wounds to the head. You didn't shoot her once, but you turned around and shot her two times. So much so that her, her viewing could not even be made by her family. I don't feign strength Great strength. Some mornings I wake up with questions of why my mother. I still recall the day I viewed my mother's body for the final time at the funeral home. Her face held no familiar semblance, and I couldn't even get her wedding ring on her finger because so much of her was distorted. I am jealous of my friends and family because they can remember all the beauty of her smile, and I grapple with my final image. But then I think, what has the right to take a residency in my mind? I remember being an eight-year-old girl traveling with her to UB as she completed her college degree. The experience of watching her earn her degree and realizing that I could attain one. She was my inspiration. I remember my mother's advice on the day of my marriage, her presence at the births of all three of my children. There, also, there was also a time, nearly 15 years ago, when she lived with me for six months. She needed to recover from a major surgery in a home where she could maneuver around easily. My mother spent those months with me and my husband. We drank coffee together and talked for hours. I was so grateful to be able to care for her as she had done for me throughout my childhood. I vividly recall October 31st, 2019, the night my husband passed away unexpectedly. 
I arrived at her house full of tears. She brushed my hair as I lay on her lap as if I were a five-year-old girl again. I have so many other memories that I've decided to write them in my journal. May 14th will always be a memory of a heinous and monstrous act of violence perpetuated by an angry man against my mother simply because of her race. An act of hatred and white supremacy. But I won't allow it to take up residency in my mind. Not when there is so much more about my mother that deserves residency there. So when my mind is invaded by May 14th, 2022, I will allow the tears to fall and the question of why to utter from my lips. But afterwards, I'll take out my journal to remember all the precious moments with my mother. Two minutes and three seconds won't steal those memories. But Peyton, I hope you are haunted every day and every night. I hope nightmares invade your sleep and convict and conviction be your constant companion. You came to Buffalo with hatred and anger in your heart. You terrorized a community, took the life of my best friend, but your anger and hatred is not greater than my love for my mother. Beautiful thoughts of her are in my mind as I write tonight. I, I'm reminded of one of my favorite scriptures and it says, now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Philippians 4 and 8. This will take up residency in my mind. Pamela Young Pritchett. And the final reading on behalf of the Morrison family, um, specifically um, Fred Morrison and his mother, who was 72, who on her birthday buried her son. Thanks, Peyton, for that. Dear sirs, the dreadful afternoon of May 14th was the day my world was turned upside down. My life has been altered in unimaginable ways. The sheer agony I felt waiting at the Mikowski School for the confirmation that my brother was one of the victims of this senseless massacre by a white supremacist is riveting. I never imagined my best friend, my only left brother, one who I shared holidays, birthdays, football game days, and most remarkably, our most precious gift we share in our mom. Now, all mom and I have left are a million questions of why, tons of lifeless pictures and a plethora of distant memories and countless tears of insurmountable pain. Thank you for that, Peyton. Oftentimes, my daily struggle is the feeling of not even wanting to live my life without him. Margus and I were inseparable. Margus was the middle son, the only living brother I had the one that fiercely protected me and my mother. He was preceded in death by my eldest brother who died suddenly from a heart attack. Now guess what, Peyton? I'm reliving the pain of loss all over again on an entire new level. Since his murder, I sometimes find myself challenged by not being able to sleep soundly, paranoia going through stores, and in my daily routine, always watching my back as if there was a target attached to me. The added responsibility of being the primary caretaker for our mother who suffered a stroke, in case you were concerned, and losing capacity to speak. I'm now left as the only child and pillow she sheds her tears of missing her baby boy Marcus Morrison on. No mother, no mother should have to bury their child, but my mother, buried her son, Margus, on her 72nd birthday. And Margus' daughter buried her dad on her 16th birthday. 
I hope you spend the rest of your life, every second, every minute, every hour, rehearsing the daunting sound of the screams and the echoes of the lives you snuffed out. I pray that when you blink your eyes, Peyton, you close them at night to sleep and you see images of the slain and feel the burden of the sorrow from every family member and friend of the fallen loved ones in our entire community of 514. I pray that every second and every minute of your 24 hours will haunt you as the absence of my brother at every birthday, holiday, game day, family gathering, and all the other times we shared. They have now become nothing but gloom and grueling for me and my family. The fact that you can sit in this courtroom with no remorse, flat affect, emotionless, shows the essence of your privilege, sir. One that my brother never had and never will. The fact that you are surrounded by white officers after you casually surrendered while my brother's blood drained from his body is a testament to society that we have a long way to go. And some people's blood is just not as important as others. Thus the reason you lived and you have the privilege of being protected. Needless to say, there is one, and I must address you, there is one Peyton that sees all, and you will not escape the fury of the Almighty. One scripture is true in the Bible, and that is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and he will repay. I pray he is merciful because I too need mercy. So I pray he is merciful to let you live so that you can be reminded of the innocent blood that my brother shed behind your calculated, sinister, demonic act that caused my beloved brother to be snatched from our family. If you don't know God, Peyton, I invite you to find him because you are going to need him. With deep sorrow, Fred Morrison, brother of Marcus Morrison. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So I want to start off with saying my dad was Andre McNeil. He um, went to that store to get a cake for my little brother because May 14th is his birthday, my little brother's birthday. And he turned three years old and he didn't get to celebrate his birthday with his dad because he never came back. So um, I was told to write an impact statement. First I was being selfish. And I said I wasn't going to do it, but then I remember I wasn't doing it for this selfish coward or the courts or the press, but I was doing it for my dad, my best friend who was snatched from this world because of something he couldn't change, the color of his skin. After I lost my uncle baby, my dad's brother, I made my dad promise me to stay on top of his house because I didn't want to lose him. And even though we had separation in life, once we did rekindle, we were inseparable. I called him for literally everything, especially when I wasn't getting my way because I knew he would make a way. But most of all, I would be lost without him because I finally found somebody who understood me to a T. We thought a lot alike. And even though he had to be dead before a friend, I always respected everything he said. He was so wise and he made the world easier to live in because he had all the answers to my wild questions. When I was around him, I wanted, I wanted to know his every move, where he was going, what he was doing, and I made sure I tagged along. And the one time he leaves without me, he doesn't come back. After this happened, I constantly beat myself up about him going, 
And I'm still pissed off because he wasn't given a chance to fight. He was blindsided. You hit him and he didn't even know he got hit. He was blindsided by a hateful death at the hands of a selfish boy who was obviously not educated on the history of African Americans. And because of you murdering my dad, I'm pissed and I'm sad and I hate you. And I didn't think I would be strong enough to look you in the face and tell you this. And how much you hurt me, my little brother, who's three years old, got to grow up without his dad. His brothers, my dad's sisters, his nieces, nephews, his grandkids. Our dad, the man who created us, was killed by a little boy who was obviously raised by hateful people. And I hate your parents too, so let them know that. And there is nothing in this world, no amount of money, anything anyone could say that'll change how I feel. This is the worst way to lose someone. So close to you and I'll never forgive you. And I don't have it in me because no matter what, it wasn't my time, it wasn't my dad's time to go. And who are you to think you control that? My father, Andre McNeil Sr., his name will live on until the day I die. So you, I don't know what else to say to you. I just hope you feel bad. I really do. And I hope, I just hope you go through it in prison. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Zion Elliott, I am Andre McNeil's brother. Andre, me and Andre are 11 months and eight days apart. On the 28th, I'll turn 53. On March 8th, he'll turn 54. Peyton, you took this from me. You took the last of my line. My mother died three days before 9-11. My brother, baby brother died in 2017. My father died in 2017. I'm all that's left besides my baby sister. But what I grew up with, you took from me, which was my brothers, my, my last, the oldest, the only one I had, the only one I could go to. You know, I became homeless, and he came in and found me and got me, brought me to his house. And shortly thus, after that, you know, he planned a party for my nephew and asked me to be here, you know, because of my work and trying to better my life. I didn't make it. But any other thing and any other day that he's in Auburn is where he lived. We were born and raised in Buffalo. Yes, we are from Buffalo. Yes, this is our home. So you took a lot from me. When you came into Buffalo and you drove past Auburn, you know, because Conklin's not that far from Auburn, actually. I don't understand why, you know, you came all the way to Buffalo when there was a million different black communities. But you shouldn't have came anywhere. You should have sat in your car first and thought about your actions. As an 18-year-old, I don't know how you could even continue on. I don't know who helped you, who talked you into it. You know, because I know a lot of 18-year-olds, white boys, so you know this. I know a lot of 18-year-old Caucasian, little friends of mine, I call them little homies. None of them are racist, so I'm confused. Especially the three that I know from Conklin, where you're from. So I'm confused on how you got past everybody with your ideology and all this nonsense. You have all these protectors of you but so that you know that they're here now. Where you're going, I've been. And your own kind's gonna get you. Just so you know, I've been in that prison. Your own kind is going to get you. Everything that you think that you know about prison and whatever they told you is a lie. Trust me, I've been there. You can ask anybody here to look up my name and they'll find three different New York State ID numbers which you're about to be. And your own kind's gonna get you. They're gonna befriend you. They're gonna do you real filthy. 
That's the sad part about it. But you took 53 years from me. You took the last of my line from me. All that I grew up with, all that I know is gone. All of it. He was all I had left. And you came in here in New Buffalo on May 14th and took that from me. I'll never understand why. I don't think anybody will. But you will get what you got coming. You will. That is a promise. As someone said, vengeance, God says vengeance is mine. He'll get you. He will get you for all of us. Do I hate you? No. Do I want to hurt you? Yes. And trust me and believe. These dudes can't stop me, really. I'm the littlest thing in here and very agile. But I don't want to hurt you. And I don't, I got nine children, ten children I got to go home to. Andre had five. And he can't even, they can't even see him anymore. And my nephew, my three-year-old nephew, every day, He's calling for his father. Asking when he's coming back from Buffalo. And he, can, and, he, and he can't? He's not coming? You know how bad that hurts? You know, it, it's sad when I got to ignore my nephew's phone calls to tell him his daddy's not coming. It's sad. Because that's all he wants to know. And I don't have an answer. But you took a lot from me. You took a lot from my family. But me, the last, I have no mother, no father, no brothers anymore. You know what you took? I don't understand. Your Honor, you've had an opportunity to hear from some of the victim's family members. They've spoken about the effect that this heinous, racially motivated act had on them, their family members, their friends, and their community. However, there are additional family members you've not heard from today. Some uh, wrote statements and chose not to speak. Others could not bear to write a statement and relive one of the most traumatic events of their lives. I would like to speak on behalf of all of those personally affected who chose not to submit a statement. And then I'd like to speak on behalf of the DA's office. Hayward Patterson's family members did not wish to speak today and did not submit a victim impact letter. Nonetheless, I can assure this court that their reluctance to speak or write a letter is because of how difficult this process is which everybody has seen today. Everyone who was in TOPS on May 14th of 2022 or knew someone who was killed on that day has experienced trauma that is not easy to speak about. Their absence is not an indication that they don't care about the outcome or that they've simply moved on. In actuality, it's an indication that they're still recovering and learning to cope and cannot yet bring themselves to confront the defendant or even articulate all of their feelings in a letter. I'd like to focus on the people who were at Top Supermarket on the day of the attack for a moment. While there are many people who escaped that horrible event alive and physically unharmed, they will be scarred emotionally for the rest of their lives. 
I visited the top supermarket where this all occurred in the aftermath of the incident, and it certainly had an immediate effect on me. And I was only present for a limited amount of time. I can't imagine what the survivors of this incident were going through during the incident as they remained hidden and quiet, hoping and praying that the defendant didn't find them and end their lives too. This time, Your Honor, I'll speak on behalf of the DA's office. On May 14th of 2022, this defendant displayed a callous disregard for human life. He drove over 200 miles out of his way with one mission, with one goal, to kill as many black people as possible. During that three hour drive, he could have turned around, but he wouldn't be deterred. He was steadfast to accomplish his goal of killing as many black people as possible and starting a race war. He fed into propaganda and lies that convinced him that somehow these innocent people who he had never heard of, who had never heard of him, who had never had a conversation with him, who had never even met him, were a threat to his very existence and identity as a white man. The defendant executed 10 people and wounded three others in slightly over two minutes. The only time he expressed a scintilla of remorse or regret is when he apologized to Christopher Braden, a white man, for shooting him. Any statement of expression or remorse at this point, any tears fall flat in the face of such violent actions. And I wholeheartedly believe that the only other regret that the defendant has is that he didn't kill more black people before he was apprehended by Buffalo police officers. In fact, the defendant was so sure of his beliefs, which were based on lies and propaganda, that he live streamed his attack with the goal of inspiring others to commit similar attacks, with the goal of tearing this community down, with the goal of spreading hatred and fear. He failed. This community is pulled together. People of all races, sexual orientations, and religions working together to show love and unity for one another. On May 14th of 2022, 10 beautiful and innocent lives were violently taken from their family, friends, and community because the defendant subscribed to hateful ideology. However, their legacy won't be as victims struck down by someone with unfathomable hatred in his heart. But instead, it'll be as a beacon of light that has brought love to this community, that made this community stronger, that united people of all races throughout our community and our country. The defendant's legacy, on the other hand, will be of a cowardly murderer who killed unarmed citizens. The defendant thought that this would create enough tension to start a race war, that we would turn on each other, he thought that everyone has as much hate in their hearts as he does. But he was wrong, and again, he failed. This community showed that they are not as ugly as the defendant's hateful ideology, and instead of choosing violence, they chose love. They showed the world that the love of this community will always be stronger than white supremacist hatred. And hopefully, the defendant will have to live with his failure for the rest of his life in a jail cell while this community continues to flourish. Your Honor, this sentencing is an opportunity to say no to racism, to say no to hate. Our chance to hold this defendant accountable and show others that think like the defendant that these acts have no place in our society and that there will be dire consequences for anyone who tries to follow in his footsteps. I ask your honor to do what justice demands, to sentence this defendant to the maximum possible sentence allowable by our laws in New York State, to sentence him to a period of life without parole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. Have the people had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence investigation and is there anything you'd like to make a record about with regard to that? We have had an opportunity to review it and 
we have nothing to add, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Anything uh, further from the people? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Parker. <laughs> I want to acknowledge that today is what I can only imagine. One of many solemn days in the lives of the survivors and the family members of those who died. Their words are heart-wrenching. Their loss, unimaginable. Only those who have lived it can truly understand their anguish. For the devastation that he caused, Peyton Gendron will be sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison with no possibility of ever being released. Our client committed these terrible crimes. He is responsible for his actions. And he will be held accountable. And he will suffer the consequences for what he did. This case highlights, however, a much deeper problem. This young man's violent, hate-fueled assault was in part the product of centuries of pervasive racism and discrimination in this country. These problems need to be addressed, just as many others have publicly demanded since this terrible event took place. Unfortunately, neither this proceeding nor any criminal trial can expose or address the historical racism that set the stage for our clients' horrible acts. We, as a community, need to have those conversations in our legislative bodies and in our living rooms to achieve meaningful change. We know that some of the families and their lawyers have asked for the information collected by law enforcement during their investigations of this crime. We support that request. We hope the resolution of this case brings the day for that information to be shared closer. The racist hate that motivated this crime was spread through online platforms. And the violence that was made possible was in part due to the easy access of assault weapons. Still, our client is responsible for this crime. He will spend the rest of his life locked away, and eventually he will die in state prison. We hope that knowing he will never be free again will offer some small bit of comfort to those that he hurt so much. Some of those most affected by his crime have expressed a need to know whether our client is remorseful. Remorseful for what he did and the devastation that he caused. We are aware, however, that for others, any expression of remorse would be meaningless and the very sight of him or the sound of his voice can be painful. At this time, he has a brief statement to make. His words are not in any way intended to inflict any further pain on those that have already suffered and we hope that they do not do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. I'm very sorry for all the pain I forced the victims and their families to suffer through. I'm very sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. 
I cannot express how much I regret all the decisions I made leading up to my actions on May 14th. I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. Looking back now, I can't believe I actually did it. I believed what I read online and acted out of hate. I know I can't take it back, but I wish I could. And I don't want anyone to be inspired by me and what I did. You don't mean none of that shit! Has the defense had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence investigation, and is there any record you wish to make with regard to that? Uh, Judge, we have had a chance to review the pre-sentence report, and we have no comment on it at this point. Is there any further comment the defense wishes to make? No, we are ready for sentencing. Right. I would like to thank you all for being here. And to thank those of you who have shared your thoughts and feelings with the courts, either in writing or in open court here today. It is very meaningful to me, and I believe that it is important for the defendant and the world to hear what you have to say. I am very sorry for your losses and the pain that you feel. I would like to recognize the heroic officers of the Buffalo Police Department who without hesitation ran towards the danger of an active shooter call, swiftly and professionally stopping and containing the defendant and putting an end to his evil rampage. Thank you. I have spent a lot of time thinking about this case our community, our nation, how we got here and where we go from here. It all comes down to character and having the strength to stand up for what is right. Our character is not defined by the good and easy times. It is defined by the hard and challenging times. And often, our character is revealed not necessarily by what we say, but by what we do. I am both immensely proud of and grateful for the way Buffalo has rejected the evil and hate that was inflicted on our community. The character of good people throughout this city, county, state, nation, and even internationally, has shown through as they have stood with the victims of this heinous and cruel act. This indictment speaks to the 13 victims and their families that lost the most, but they are not the only victims. There are thousands that have been traumatized directly and vicariously by this defendant's actions. We have seen the community turn out in support and are seeing signs of much needed change in East Buffalo. It is a testament to the power of love and compassion to overcome evil and hate by turning pain into purpose. But it is just the beginning. We have a long way to go. This hateful act and other similar hateful acts across the country, motivated by white supremacy and replacement theory, are a reckoning for us as a nation. 
The ugly truth is that our nation was founded and built in part on white supremacy, starting with the treatment of Native Americans by the first European settlers, to the cruel, inhumane, economic engine, nation-building practice of slavery, to indentured servitude, to Jim Crow laws, to government policies creating segregated public housing with communities of color often placed in environmentally hazardous locations, to the manner in which expressways were built, dividing urban neighborhoods to create easy access to government subsidized developments in the suburbs with restricted covenants prohibiting the sale of suburban homes to African Americans, to redlining practices in communities of color, further devaluing those neighborhoods, to the GI Bill, a well-deserved financial boon to our servicemen, unless, of course, you were a serviceman of color to the war on drugs and mass incarceration disproportionately of men of color, to the school to prison pipeline, to inequities in education, employment opportunities, and compensation, to the existence of food deserts and inadequacies in healthcare. Our history is replete with both individual and systemic discriminatory practices, many of them still firmly in place today. In fact, it is these very policies and practices that contributed to and made this atrocity possible. The effects of these policies, some current and others decades and centuries old, created the segregation in our city and enabled this defendant to research and identify his target to maximize the impact of his evil intent. All of these policies and systems, either sponsored or tolerated by the government and implemented by individuals, were designed to destroy the very fabric of family life, opportunities for success, the creation of generational wealth, and even the mere existence of hope in communities of color. The harsh reality is that white supremacy has been an insidious cancer on our society and nation since its inception and it undermines the notions of a meritocracy and the land of opportunity that we hold so dear. However, white supremacy is not inevitable or unstoppable. It has been carefully cultivated and nurtured by individuals and the government for centuries. This is the history that we have all inherited it has been passed down from generation to generation. We must acknowledge that history. See that history for what it is. Recognize it and learn from it or we are doomed to repeat it. Let ours be the generation to put a stop to it. We can do better. We must do better. Our own humanity requires it. As an individual, we must call out injustice in our daily lives when we see it. We must reject racism in all of its forms. We must be conscious 
of the power of our words and actions and the impact they have on those around us, both intended and unintended. We must demand better of our public servants in their efforts to address inequity. And we must embrace government policies aimed at creating and fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion. We must make the outpouring of support, love, and compassion that followed this heinous act an everyday practice. We are stronger together. These are hard and challenging times. Our characters are being tested. The future of our nation is at stake. Are we up to the challenge? I believe that we are. In the words of Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman, there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Mr. Gendron, please stand. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. There can be no mercy for you, no understanding, no second chances. The damage you have caused is too great and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. It is the judgment of this court for your conviction under the first count of the indictment, a domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate in the first degree, an A1 felony that you be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Under the second count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Roberta Drury, a vibrant 32-year-old young woman, a daughter, a dedicated sister and friend, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the third count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 67-year-old Hayward Patterson, a son, father, and friend, known as a faithful, hardworking, generous, well-dressed man, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the fourth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 77-year-old Pearl Young, a daughter, mother, grandmother, and friend, known for being a loving, dedicated substitute teacher, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the fifth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 86-year-old Ruth Whitfield, a daughter, sister, wife, mother, and grandmother, a dedicated caretaker, an avid fisherwoman, and a valued member of her church community, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the sixth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Celestine Cheney, a daughter, sister, mother, aunt, grandmother, and friend, a fighter who at 65 had beat cancer and multiple aneurysms, 
a person who enjoyed life and laughed easily. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the seventh count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Aaron Salter, age 55, a son, brother, husband, and father, a car guy, and a lover of camping, a retired Buffalo police officer, heroic and selfless to the very end. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the eighth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree for the murder of 53-year-old Andre McNeil, a son, brother, uncle, father, and fiance, devoted Miami Heat fan, survived by a three-year-old son. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the ninth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Margus Morrison, age 52, a son, brother, husband, and father. He loved music and sneakers. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the 10th count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 72-year-old Catherine Massey, Cat, a daughter, sister, aunt, and friend, an activist known for her sincerity, thoughtfulness, and honesty. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the 11th count of the indictment, murder in the first degree for the murder of Geraldine Talley, age 62, a daughter, mother, and aunt, the life of the party, and a top-notch baker. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. By operation of law, the sentences on counts 2 through 11 must run concurrently with the sentence imposed on the first count. Under the remaining counts of the indictment to which you pled, the law permits me, based on your age, to consider granting you youthful offender status. The purpose of youthful offender status under the law is to prevent the stigmatization of young offenders based on hasty and thoughtless acts, and to provide them a fresh start <clears throat> and a renewed opportunity to be a law-abiding, productive member of society. However, given the manner in which you methodically planned, researched, conducted recognizance, and executed your hateful crimes, a finding of youthful offender status is not appropriate. There has, was nothing hasty or thoughtless about your conduct. There are no mitigating factors to be considered. You will be sentenced as an adult on the remaining counts. Under the 22nd count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree, for the attempted murder of 20-year-old Zaire Goodman, a beloved son, a hardworking young man of character. I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. Under the 23rd count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree, for the attempted murder of 55-year-old Christopher Braden, a son, father, husband, and friend, a professional serving the needs of the good people of the city of Buffalo. 
I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. Under the 24th count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree for the attempted murder of Jennifer Warrington, age 50, daughter, mother, wife, friend, a professional serving the needs of the good people of the city of Buffalo. I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. Under the 25th count of the indictment, criminal possession of a weapon in the second degree. I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 15 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. I am assessing the mandatory surcharge of $300, the crime victim assistance fee of $25, and a DNA fee of $50. You have 30 days to appeal the sentence of this court. This concludes these proceedings, and the court will stand in recess. It is 11.43, you just watched the sentencing of Peyton Gendron. Justice served nine months and one day after he drove to Buffalo more than 200 miles and shot and killed 10 people, shot and injuring three other people. We watched the prosecution and defense speak. We heard him speak mm -hmm. for the first time and you heard the emotions that came out after you heard screaming, sobbing yeah. in the courtroom. We heard from 13 people impacted by the shooting on this day, and it it was huge. Yeah. Emotions, right? Emotions running high in that courtroom, of course, as the sentencing had to be paused for a brief moment, and mm -hmm. Gendron taken from the courtroom, then brought back in for the rest of those impact statements to be read. And we do have some guests with us who are here with us today as we're breaking down what exactly happened in the courtroom and taking a look then at what happens as we move forward. I want to thank once again Chris Belling for being here with us to be our legal analyst and Franchelle Parker as well from Open Buffalo. Chris, I want to start by just asking you, this was the first time anyone has heard from this shooter now that he's been sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, but he spoke before that sentence. I want to ask what you thought of what he had to say. You know, he says he can't can't express his regret enough. He did a terrible thing. He couldn't believe what he did. He doesn't want anybody to be inspired by him. What did you make of the statement the first time that we're hearing from him in his own words? Well, the, the big question is, what did he think of his statement? Mm. Uh, d does he believe what he said, or is he saying it because he's trying to avoid the federal death penalty, or because he's trying to look better uh, to other inmates when he gets to prison, state prison or federal prison? Um, I am not surprised by what he said. Uh, I would hope he believes what he said. Um, I, I believe that the, this entire event uh, is a uh, symbolic manifestation of uh, a, a lot of things that uh, are wrong with our society. The judge uh, uh, talked mm -hmm. fairly extensively about racism, etc. Uh, I think that uh, one thing that only Brian Parker, the defense attorney, mentioned is the uh, in, entire perversion of the thought process of society uh, by the internet. Uh, it, the First Amendment, of course, exists for a reason, uh, but the people that uh, designed the Constitution and put the First Amendment in place had no concept, uh, by the way, also the Second Amendment had no concept of uh, uh, assault rifles, but the First Amendment mm -hmm. had no concept of the internet and what could be done with that. Right. Uh, Peyton Gendron uh, is, um, uh, as Franchelle said, uh, he's 18 years old. He's, uh, a, a, if you will, a petri dish into which the internet planted the spores that grew into this monster that uh, committed this crime. 
Uh, so I think that there's a, another aspect of this that nobody said anything about today but Brian Parker, the defense attorney, and, and it's, that's important, I believe. Mm -hmm. And Francia, let me also ask you too, because this is the first time we're hearing from this shooter. The community members are there. We could tell people were outraged. People obviously very emotional and rightfully so. What did you make of what he had to say? And I know you know so many of the members of that community. <coughs> I, I hope he means it. Um, I hope that there is a 15 year old kid somewhere in Western New York that actually is taking pause to what he's reading or what she's reading online now. Um, I hope that the, his words or remorse um, resonates with someone and that this, um, this type of horrific massacre never happens again. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know his intentions. Um, I, I pray that this is a warning sign mm -hmm. to someone else that maybe isn't contemplating um, mass murder, but there's so much hate and conspiring that's happening across this nation that hopefully his words are causing pause in someone also that we're getting to a place in society where um, there there are no more bystanders mm -hmm. when we're noticing um, things that seem like strange behavior that we're addressing them that we have the the courage that we're brave enough to address racism and white supremacy um, not just during times of um, massive awareness but at the dinner table, mm -hmm. that we're having these difficult conversations with a cousin, an uncle, and that we're, we're taking them seriously, but we need everyone, everyone, to be actively involved in those conversations. Mm -hmm. Today was unprecedented. We wanna show you some video yeah, from check, the check, courtroom. Check, check. Here Tensions we are. Check. were rising in every second of this mm -hmm. proceeding. We heard from 13 people, such an emotional time mm -hmm. uh, to be in that courtroom, obviously in the middle uh, when Kat Massey's someone who was representing her right. was speaking and, and she was she walked up and she said look I'm not gonna be nice right. you know she she was upset and someone walked up and and tried to lunge at, at right. Gendron and you know judge walked off the bench you know some of these things you've never seen before I want to show everybody that clip just in case you haven't gotten a chance to see it this is what happened in the courtroom today is those emotions ran very high and one of the victims advocates was speaking and then you can see someone rush toward the shooter he was quickly ushered out of the courtroom again just in a, a moment of high emotions everything took a moment to get back to order and then those victim impact statements continued and my colleague ed dranch has been covering this trial for us since the beginning since the shooting itself happened back on may 14th and he was in the courtroom this morning so i want to bring ed in as well because he is live outside of the courtroom right now after having sat in on what happened hi ed talk to us from the perspective of what happened in that courtroom and what you can tell us right now i have never in my life experienced something like this. Uh, I've been covering crime and courts now for more than 15 years. And to A, have the sheer emotion that we experienced inside the courtroom be on full display, not only for Gendron to see the killer, the white supremacist, the racist, to see how he impacted these families, not only for Western New Yorkers to see, not only for the country to see, but for the world to see. These people are real. These are our neighbors. There were 10 people who were shot and killed because of the color of their skin. The emotion on full display. The idea that white supremacy and racism cannot stand in our city, our county, our region, the western New York area, the country, the state, the world. The idea that this is still so pervasive was on full display today. You heard it from the judge. The judge said we have a long way to go. You heard it from Zanetta Everhart, whose son Zaire Goodman was shot but miraculously survived on May 14th. There is a long way to go. And you heard it from so many others inside that courtroom. The two people who spoke, 
who survived, they were white. And you heard it from the one person on the defense team who was a person of color say that the only time this suspect, this shooter, the white supremacist terrorist who came to Buffalo on May 14th with an intention to kill, the only time that person apologized was to Christopher Braden, who was working at Tops. He was shot in the leg, and Gendron, the shooter, never shot him again. Though you heard from others, like Michelle Spite, who said, Gendron turned around and shot her family members twice. Pam Pritchett, who's Pearl Young's daughter, wasn't here today. She's actually traveling right now in Alabama. I've been in very close contact with her. I've developed a relationship with her in the last nine months and one day. And she's retracing her mother's journey because as you heard today, this isn't just something that happened, right? Like this idea of racism isn't just something that Peyton Gendron woke up with one day and decided I'm gonna come from Conklin, New York to Buffalo, more than two hours away to shoot and kill 10 black people. This is hundreds of years in the making. Our country founded on the roots of racism, on the backs of black people, Native Americans. And as the judge said, something has got to change throughout all of this. Aaron Salter's wife was sobbing in the courtroom. And really, this is the rare time that we're able to hear from some of these people. We don't often hear from a lot of these victims' families. We hear from Garnell Whitfield. We hear from Zanetta Everhart. We hear from Pam Pritchett and Michelle Spite. Wayne, uh, we've heard from him as well. But to hear the powerful and profound words from some of these people will be everlasting. Listen to what Mrs. Salter had to say. My name is Kimberly Salter, and I stand here this morning on behalf, on behalf and with my husband, Aaron Salter. My family and I are here this morning, and we wear red and black. Red for the blood that he shed for his family and for his community. And black because we are still grieving. That was Aaron Salter's widow. Salter, a former Buffalo police officer who was defending Tops, was shot and killed by Peyton Gendron as he was trying to defend his store. So many of these people were blindsided. The fear, the terror they faced came out today and came to a head in the courtroom. And I was thinking about this while I was sitting there and came up with five key takeaways here from inside the courtroom as I was listening to these victim impact statements and I was listening to the judge and the prosecution and the defense speak. And I'll just bullet point them for you. Number one, and I know Franchelle is in the studio and I hope she's listening here and I would love for her to weigh in as well. Number one, there is a lot of pain and trauma still in our community. And it's not just from this one day that they call the black 9-11 where 10 people were shot and killed and three others were shot but survived. But from decades and centuries of maltreatment and from decades of racism in our own community and systemic racism, it's governmental racism, the idea of redlining, the fact that there is one real grocery store in this area and that without it, people are going without healthy foods. Number two, the fact that emotions are high. We saw it. We heard the outbursts. We heard the yelling. We heard the sobbing. But it's emotion that we all need to hear. It's emotion that we all need to feel. But the idea that these people were human, brings me to my third point, the humanity of all of this. These people were doing something we all do. They were grocery shopping. 
Ruth Whitfield was getting seeds to plant for her garden. Her granddaughter spoke today and said, even though she wasn't able to plant those seeds in her garden, the seeds she planted in her children and her grandchildren will live on forever. something you mentioned, being in that courtroom, mm -hmm. you sitting there hearing the sobs. I, I can recall back to the day when it happened. I went to um, a nearby school that's where they had the families sit and sure. stay um, to and find out were, what had they happened. they were waiting at that point. They were waiting to find out whether or not their loved ones had made it. And sitting in that parking lot, you hear screams and, and uh. sobs that you never think you'd have to hear mm -hmm. on a beautiful Saturday afternoon in Buffalo when people were just trying to do their grocery shopping. Just such an unprecedented day. And Chris, I know we were talking a lot about just how unprecedented this is. You know, usually there's one person per victim that gets to speak, but today was different. Right, well, I, I continue to say, and I'll say again, the unprecedented nature of the case. Uh, everybody needed to speak because everybody needed to be heard and everybody needed to hear what they had to say, as Ed pointed out uh, in point two uh, of his Ed uh, points. Uh, but uh, yeah, it just a very unusual proceeding uh, without precedent uh, in, and I've been doing this 48 years now, um, so it's just something that uh, uh, our community has lived through and has left uh, an unprecedented and indelible uh, picture on everybody. Mm, absolutely a mark that will never be erased but also never forgotten and for good reason of course because we need to realize what happened in our community and we need to realize that we have to be better mm -hmm. and I think that the judge touched on that when she addressed the court after everything had concluded after all of those victim impact statements had been read so I, I want you to listen to what she had to say and take note of what her words were. The harsh reality is that white supremacy has been an insidious cancer on our society and nation since its inception. And it undermines the notions of a meritocracy and the land of opportunity that we hold so dear. However, white supremacy is not inevitable or unstoppable. It has been carefully cultivated and nurtured by individuals and the government for centuries. This is the history that we have all inherited. It has been passed down from generation to generation. We must acknowledge that history. See that history for what it is. Recognize it. And learn from it, or we are doomed to repeat it. Okay, some incredibly powerful words there. We do want to take you right now, though, to the district attorney's office, where we are expecting to hear from a number of people involved in this case right now. I want to take you live there because it's starting right now, and we'll come back after. In state prison, he has directed us not to file an appeal. In court today, he expressed remorse for the terrible racist crimes he committed, and he apologized to those he hurt so much. He also urged others who have been similarly poisoned by hate not to follow in his footsteps. Though he has felt this way for a long time, today the court gave him the opportunity to express this remorse publicly. We fully understand, as does he, that no words he says could ease the grief and anguish that he caused. What we heard in court today from the survivors and their families was heart-wrenching. Their loss is unimaginable. For the devastation he caused, Peyton Gendron was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison with no possibility of release. Our client committed these terrible crimes. He is responsible for his actions. He has been held accountable and will suffer the consequences for what he did. The case highlights a much deeper problem. This young man's violent 
hate-fueled assault was in part the product of centuries of pervasive racism and discrimination in this country. These problems need to be addressed, as many others have publicly stated and demanded since this terrible event took place. Unfortunately, neither this proceeding nor any criminal trial can expose or address the historical racism that set the stage for our clients' horrible acts. We as a community need to have those conversations in our legislative bodies and our living rooms to achieve any sort of meaningful change. We know that some of the families and their lawyers have asked for the information collected by law enforcement during their investigations of this crime. We support that request. We hope that the resolution of this case brings the day for that information to be shared closer. The racist hate motivated this crime. It was spread through online platforms. And the violence was made possible by the access, easy access to assault weapons. Still, our client is responsible for committing this crime. He will spend the rest of his life locked away, and he will eventually die in state prison. We hope that knowing that he will never be free again will offer some small bit of comfort to those that he has hurt so much. Thank you. Just your names, Joe, you Brian Parker. Robert Cutting. Dan Dubois. Thank you. That was the defense team for Peyton Gendron speaking just after he was sentenced. We are waiting to hear from the district attorney, but so much to talk about mm -hmm. until then. You know, they make a point to say, and when he was speaking in court, you could hear the emotion mm -hmm. in his voice. He said, point blank, our client committed these crimes. Mm -hmm. Our client committed these crimes, and he does feel remorseful. But we hope that today provides just a little bit of comfort right. for the people that were in the in in the room. Emotions running high, and so many people in the room saying they forgive him, and hope that right. he does feel that remorse and can move on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, so much. And, and we already have so much information about what exactly happened and mm -hmm. what led up to the shooting. We know there was a manifesto. We know the entire thing was live streamed, which is just so sickening to think and so heartbreaking for all of these families involved. But the defense attorney, Brian Parker, just mentioning that this information, additional information that was gathered will be released to the families. So I wanted to ask Chris Belling, who's joining us, um, what kind of other information might we be looking for here? What, what would we expect to see come out of something like that? Well. In, in a normal situation, uh, much of the background information, including the live stream, including mm -hmm. uh, the uh, manifesto, including those things that the uh, police and the FBI have uh, taken out of the internet and hopefully taken down as well, uh, would not be available for any level of public consumption. What the defense has urged here uh, is for that uh, information to be released to people who might be able to use it positively to attack racism, to attack um, the pollution of minds via the internet, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that uh, is where they're going with this uh, because it's obviously the root of the problem that put their client in the situation he's in and is now sending him to state prison for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And we were listening to so many family members today as they spoke out for the first time face to face with the shooter, the person who killed their loved ones. And if you're just joining us right now as we get into the noon hour here, on 7 News. We want to thank you for joining us and we also want to play some of those statements, some of those things those family members had to say as they face that shooter this morning. Here they are. Your life was meaningless before May 14th, 2022 and you woke up every day feeling small. You clearly did not value your own life which allowed you to devalue the lives of others. Even with all of the heartache that you have caused, you still have failed to break our family spirit. You thought you broke us, but you awoke us. We all know the pure hatred and motivations behind your heinous crime, and we are here to tell you that you failed. We will continue to elevate and be everything that you are not, everything that you hate, and everything that you intended to destroy. Despite our battle scars, we will not, you will not, 
win the war. You know, there's a... Now we want to bring it back, District Attorney John Flynn. A is saying in media. life I want to take you um, live right now. where people articulate events that occur and things that happen in the context of time <clears throat> as the beginning of the end. I, I tend to look at life a little differently. <clears throat> I um, tend to be more hopeful, I guess. And so... I would characterize what happened today as the end of the beginning. That while what happened today puts a legal closure to the criminal proceedings, let's put aside the federal matter just for our purposes here, puts a, a legal closure to this tragic incident on May 14th of 2022, it certainly does not put any closure on what we need to do as a society and as a community going forward. And a lot of people have articulated and stated in various fashions and on various mediums of ideas that need to be in place to go forward. Where do we go as a community? Where do we go as a city? Where do we go in terms of the legal system and the criminal justice system and how it affects not only particular cases but society at large? And so these are questions that we need to answer, that us as leaders of the criminal justice system and the mayor and of all levels of government need to answer. What, what happened today though, what happened throughout the prosecution of this case is still important. I would say that justice was done with a small J today, but we still have a big J of justice to do. But the small J for justice that occurred today was important. We should not minimize that. And in looking toward the future and in looking what we need to do, we still need to keep in light of what happened in the past six months. This prosecution and the resolution of this case is unprecedented. The mayor correctly stated it at the very beginning on May 14th or May 15th that swift justice is needed. And swift justice was done. Not only was it swift, it was just. It was just in the sense that he pled guilty to every charge. He pled guilty to, for the first time in the history of New York State, the domestic terrorism charge motivated by hate. Never been done in the history of the state of New York. It was done here in Buffalo, New York. And today, he received the just sentence for the commission of that crime. And I know that one of the family members spoke about you know, I'm going to follow you for the rest of your life and whenever you're up for parole, et cetera, et cetera. There is no parole here. He is never getting out of jail. The federal prosecution is relevant, obviously, in, the, in terms of whether or not he is going to get the death penalty. But that's the only decision that really needs to be made in this entire process. He will spend, no matter what, the rest of his life behind bars. Never eligible for parole, never eligible for probation, never eligible for anything except viewing bars behind them for the rest of his life. Period. And that, I submit, is justice. You know, as, as a DA, 
I, you know, most of you all know me. There's some out of town reporters here, you know, you don't know me, but I, I tend to stay in my lane. And, you know, my lane is obviously a narrow lane, but it's important. It's important in the sense that a message needed to be sent that this individual was going to be held accountable for his actions. Now, I get it that whenever these mass shootings occur and tragedies like this happen nationwide, one just happened yesterday in Michigan State. The, the, the sides, whatever side you're on, tend to get out there. We need gun control. No, it's not gun control. We need people control. No, it's not people control. We need online control. As those of you who know me, I, I don't like sides. I like solutions. Everything needs to be on the table. Yes, we have a gun problem. Yes, we have a social media problem. But we also have a people problem. And that cannot be discounted. People need to be held accountable for their actions. People need to be taken off the streets and put away in prison to remove them from society. This defendant needed to be removed from society, taken off the streets, and put behind bars for the rest of his life. And he was. And that gives me some satisfaction. As I said before, obviously we got a lot of work to do. We need to make sure that from a DA's perspective, that anyone who commits a hate crime, anyone who incites act of violence based upon people's race, religion, creed, color, whatever it may be, be held accountable for their actions. And that is what I will do in my remaining time as DA. I know that the, a lot of the family members spoke today. I, um, you know, we all knew that today's sentence was a foregone conclusion, quite frankly, in the sense that when he pled guilty a few months ago, he was getting this sentence no matter what. But today gave the family members an opportunity to speak and to speak publicly and to speak to the system. And they did, and I thank them for that. I thank my assistant DA, Justin Caldwell, for speaking on behalf of my office and telling the judge what we exactly wanted, which is obviously what we wanted from the get-go by him pleading guilty to the charge of domestic terrorism, he will never get out of jail. And I thank Justin for that as well. Now, again, where we go forward from here is a question we all need to answer. Not just those in law, of us in law enforcement, but all of us in society. The immediate future, obviously, is continuing to help these families. And as the DA, I always try to keep the victims of crime first and foremost in my eyes and on my mind. And even though the case is over, from my perspective, we still need to help the victims. And I want to echo what the defense attorney, Mr. Parker, stated, where he stated on the record that he was willing to help the families in their pursuits of investigative materials to help them in their civil suits. And I want to echo that as well. I am here to help the families. 
there right now are two protective orders in place. There is a state protective order in place that precludes me from giving any information away to the victims or their attorneys. Now, that protective order on the state side does not automatically go away today by operation of law. That continues on until we change it. And so um, I will be making, um, in some form or fashion, uh, a motion to the court to get that protective order lifted or asking it to be lifted. On the federal side, the, the problem is that I'm going to guess that 99.9% .9 of all the investigative materials that I have, the feds also have. We have the same stuff. If there's five sheets of paper that are different, I'd be shocked. And so the problem is going to be that while that federal case is pending, it's going to be difficult for the feds to release that documentation to the families. And so, like I mentioned, there is a federal order, protective order in place that has my name on it. Now, I was never a party to that at all. I never consented to that at all. But somehow, um, the Erie County DA's office name got put on that protective order. So I will be also, in some, uh, some fashion, making a motion to the federal court to get my name removed from that. And I am hopeful that we can work out an agreement that's somehow judicially supervised where the materials can be turned over to the civil attorneys so they can review it and prepare their lawsuits and then a protective order put on them where they can't disclose to the public. There's things like that that can be done. And so I am hopeful that that can occur. Um, obviously, this would all be a moot point if the federal case gets resolved sooner rather than later. But again, I'm not going to step on their toes at all. Uh, I will not be commenting at all about whether or not I think the death penalty should be in place or not be in place or anything about the federal case at all. Um, I'll, I'll stay in my lane, and I'm not going to step on their toes or get, get into that at all. Uh, but uh, I am going to get into continuing to help the families and doing everything I can to help them further along. So uh, with that being said, um, let me just uh, end here with my heartfelt thanks and gratitude. Uh, obviously, none of this would have taken place today without the city of Buffalo. And the city of Buffalo uh, includes the mayor's office, and the Buffalo Police Department. And obviously, it was the heroic members of the Buffalo Police Department uh, that arrived on the scene. You talk about swiftness. Uh, the swiftness of justice pales in comparison to the swiftness of the Buffalo Police Department in responding to that 911 call and getting the tops within minutes. And so uh, I cannot thank the Buffalo Police Department uh, the commissioner uh, and the mayor of the great city of Buffalo, Byron Brown, for all his, of his work and all of their work uh, in bringing this case to fruition. Mayor, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. D. Well, I want to start out with thanks and gratitude. I want to thank District Attorney John Flynn and his district, assistant district attorneys for doing a tremendous job in prosecuting uh, this horrific case and helping the wheels of justice uh, turn very swiftly in this instance. I want to thank uh, Police Commissioner Grimalia and the members of the Buffalo Police Department uh, for responding so swiftly to this crime uh, and preventing further loss of life. If not for the very quick response of the Buffalo Police Department, it was the intent of this individual to kill more black people, to take more black lives, and the Buffalo Police Department prevented that. 
Uh, this clearly was an act of domestic terrorism motivated by hate. And clearly, this individual was guilty. Uh, we all saw it. The individual broadcast it. They put it on social media. Uh, as District Attorney Flynn said, uh, he pled guilty. There was never any doubt of what the outcome of this sentencing was going to be today. Uh, Police Commissioner Grimalia and I uh, were in the sentencing today. We wanted to support uh, the members of our community, the families of the victims. Uh, the 10 precious people who were killed, uh, the three others that were wounded, uh, we wanted to be there to support them, and we wanted to be there to have eyes on this defendant uh, to demonstrate the strong desire in this community to see justice done. The statements of the family members that spoke were incredibly powerful. Uh, if you had any human feeling whatsoever, it was hard to hold it together in that courtroom and not have the tears flow and the emotion flow. Uh, the family members in powerful detail shared with us the depth of their loss the magnitude of what was taken from them. Their courage, their ability to speak under these circumstances is just amazing to me. I, I see the family members and how they have stood up through this, how they have stayed together through this and fought for justice for their family members as nothing short of heroic as well. I can tell you, uh, and the DA alluded to it, uh, certainly what we heard today, uh, the comments of the defense attorney, uh, the comments of Judge Susan Egan in rendering her decision, what happened in this community certainly uh, cries out for sensible gun reform. Uh, why the city of Buffalo has brought a lawsuit against ghost gun manufacturers and members of the uh, gun industry. Uh, it cries out for uh, mental health uh, treatment and resources. Thank you to Governor Hochul uh, for putting resources in the proposed state budget for more mental health resources in the state of New York. Uh, this cries out for reining in social media. The defense attorney said that this individual uh, was definitely impacted, radicalized by social media. We have to rein that in. We cannot allow hate speech to proliferate on social media. And finally, white supremacy. It is a cancer, uh, it is a horror, uh, and it is capable of motivating people to commit these kinds of crimes in our community. More has to be done to stamp out uh, white supremacy and its proliferation. This mass shooting in Buffalo, we had hoped and prayed that this would be the last one we saw um, when it occurred May 14th, uh, 2022. Sadly, uh, last year there were hundreds more after Buffalo. This year, already 67 mass shootings in the United States of America. So the DA is, is right. Uh, this is the end of the beginning. There's a lot more work to be done, not just in this community, uh, but all across America. And so I am thankful, again, for the work of District Attorney Flynn uh, and his office. Uh, I continue 
and all of us continue to pray for the strength of the families of the victims, uh, that God will hold them up uh, and continue to give them strength as they go through this trauma. Uh, and finally, I will say, uh, while these families have been traumatized, our entire community has been traumatized by this, as Judge Egan indicated. Uh, it will take some time uh, for all of us to get through the trauma uh, that we experienced on 514. But we are a strong community. We are a resilient community. We are a community that stands together in times of difficulty, and we will in this time as well. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> he will be transferred probably to tomorrow to federal custody, and then that prosecution will go forward. Um, again, like I said, I, I don't have any control over that at all. Um, you know, we don't we don't talk about that at all. At all. And so they will um, <clears throat> they they will then continue the prosecution of their case. But he will be transferred uh, probably by tomorrow uh, into federal custody. Any potential repercussions with what happened in the courtroom today at all, or was that just handled? No, there's no repercussions. Um, I told the uh, OCA officers um, not to charge him, so he will not be charged. Th this has um, this has happened before. Um, you know, that, I, I don't know if if the Office of Court Administration has a budget line or not for you know damaged property, um, but. Um, you know, people have punched holes in walls before, um, and you know, we can we can fix it. And so, you know, obviously, uh, I am. Um, you know, emotions are high. This is a this is a tragic incident that occurred in our city. Um, I'm not going to compound that tragedy by charging someone with criminal mischief. Um, now, again, let, let let me be clear though. I don't want this can't happen. You know, every day. Obviously, don't. Don't, don't let my mercy here on one individual um, allow others tomorrow or the next day to, you know, attack people in the courtroom or damage courtroom property because, you know, at some point um, I'm going to get, I will charge you, <laughs> all right? So don't, don't let that, um, don't let today serve as an indicator of my future decisions. Comments about not wanting his crime to inspire others. Is that empty, or do you think it could have an effect on other one of these patents around the world? I think his remorse is too little, too late. Uh, as was said, the time to be remorseful uh, was when the thought first came into his mind to kill innocent people. Uh, the time to be remorseful was when he drove, was driving two hours, uh, pardon me, driving uh, hundreds of miles uh, and over three hours to get to this community. That's when he should have felt remorse, stopped himself and turned around and not done it. So what the defendant had to say today uh, to me is much too little, much too late. I. I anticipate that the reason why he said what he said today was to save his life in federal court. Um, that's, that's the only reason why he probably said it, because I, along with the mayor, agree it's too little too late, but to me, was not hurtful at all. Could that have an impact, though? Potentially. And what about what the family members have told us? Some of them have said that they want him to spend the rest of his life in prison. Others have said they want him. Again, you know, as a as a prosecutor, um, again, I, I can't speak for the feds, obviously, but you know, I, I can tell you what I do. You know, as a prosecutor, I always, um, you know, listen to the victims uh, of crimes and, and get their input. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is the prosecutor's decision uh, on whether or not to um, take a plea, do something at trial, or recommend a sentencing. And so, um, at the end of the day, that will be the, the federal prosecutor's decision. Um, but, you know, again, I suspect, like I do, they will take input from the family members. 
Do you think there's a very good chance he will face the death penalty on the federal level? I'm not going to comment on that. I, I have no idea. I have no idea what um, what mechanisms uh, mechanisms are in place for that. Well, I mean, I you know I know the decision making authority is not going to happen here in Buffalo. It'll happen in Washington D.C. at the Department of Justice main main building. Um, you know, they will make that call. Uh, but I have, like I said, I have no input on that at all, and I have no no knowledge of what is going through their minds right now at all, so I really can't comment. Commissioner Vermalia, with the emotions of a day like this, was there any heightened sense of alert for your officers and the department just to make sure that nobody would cause any problems being from outside or coming into the community, anything like that? Yeah, we, we had planning. I mean, we have, uh, you can see there's a police presence outside, and, and there's things that you don't see, but, uh, you know, you're definitely right on the emotion part. It was a tough day. Um, you know, this is a this has been tough since uh, May 14th at 2.28 in the afternoon. Um, you know, you, you'd think that today uh, brings some kind of resolution, and it, and it really doesn't. Uh, it was a very hard day, and, and I commend the family members uh, who, who were able to actually go up there and, and, and face him and, um, you know, say what they had to say, and not to take anything away from the family members that didn't. Uh, they're going through so much. They will be going through so much for a long time, but um, it's, it's a lot on on the community, it's a lot, of course, on the family, it's a lot on our officers. It's, it's been a lot that everyone's gone through. Yeah, one over here. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I kind of wanted to get thoughts from you. You were sitting in the front row, so you saw this family member rush the shooter. So from your vantage point, with everything you've been feeling, being at the helm of the city, what were you feeling when you saw that? Can you take us through your thoughts? You know, as, as has been said, it was a tough day. Uh, it was a very emotional day. Uh, as mayor, as a member of the community, sitting there, listening to the statements of the family members, it was very painful. Uh, several times I, I felt like I was going to have to reach for a tissue, it was so painful. Emotions were running incredibly high. I can understand uh, people wanting to rush the defendant not the right thing to do, uh, didn't want to see it happen, but can understand it uh, because this is such a painful thing. This is such a gut-wrenching thing uh, that happened to members of our community and happened uh, to the members of the family of the people who were in the courtroom today. So I understand the emotion that people were feeling. Over there, Jim. Without the benefit of a trial, we never got to hear all your evidence. Um, now that it's been adjudicated, what about the parents? Or, or were there any other pieces of, of evidence that, that your office was able to unearth that speaks or spoke to his motivation, to his, his preparation, to anything that you're Yeah, no, no, nothing more has been articulated already. Um, I mean, again, uh, obviously, this was um, uh, all videotaped. You know, the, uh, he, he was live streaming it as it was going along. Uh, you know, we had uh, obviously the, uh, the writings that, that he, that he uh, produced. Um, you know, there were two sets of, of documents, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, the manifesto has gotten a lot of play, but there was also a second document um, that, that he generated as well that was more kind of a compilation of materials than actually, you know, written by him uh, that, again, you know, showed his motivation of hate uh, and his, uh, uh, his reasoning, warped as it may be, of, of why he wanted to do this. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, you don't need a motive, obviously, in a, in a, in a murder prosecution. You want to have one. Uh, and we had a motive here uh, all along. Uh, we had um, we had live stream witness testimony. We had the ballistics. Um, we had the weapon. Uh, you know, we had pretty much a slam dunk case from the moment this ended. Uh, and again, yeah, there's no real new evidence that that came about. As far as the family members are concerned, <clears throat> I know that uh, you know during the guilty plea that occurred a couple months ago. One of the family members made a comment that, you know, she heard something uh, on that day for the first time. 
you know, we, you know, d during the course of a prosecution, y you need to hold some things close to your vest as far as evidence is, and so you, know, you don't want it out there. Um, you know, again, I, I, I apologize to that family member, you know, who, who might have heard something for the first time that was upsetting to them. Uh, and, you know, the reason for it was not to hide anything from the family at all. It was basically to just, you know, prepare for trial in the event we had to go to court uh, and not having that evidence out there that could be used by the other side against us or against justice. So by, by holding things back and by keeping our evidence, you know, um, somewhat tight to the vest, we're doing that for the family's sake. We're doing that to help the families because we want a guilty verdict. The photo of Jared was still working with clear, him. Clear, yeah. Clear, so he will not go to state prison now. He'll go to federal detention. Well, he'll, he'll go. He'll go to federal detention to be held there while the uh, prosecution of the federal case will occur. Any indication how long that might take? No, I don't have no idea. Months, now, months. I, I, I really don't know, sir. I mean, again, I'm not. I'm not in the federal courthouse. I'm not in the building. I, I'm not talking to them at all about you know what what they're what they're doing. So I really don't know. Um, now. After it's over, um, so he'll be transferred to the federal facility now for pretrial confinement um, for federal purposes, all right? When the federal proceeding is over, then a decision will be made, will he go, let, let, let's assume they don't go to death penalty, all right? He goes to jail. Uh, a decision will be made, will he go to state prison for the rest of his life or to federal prison for the rest of his life? And, um, well, no, 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 because because the state judge ordered them to do that. We'll we'll talk amongst ourselves then on, on what we feel is the best, uh, you know, path forward. Um, it'll probably be be a federal uh, uh, center um, because they have um, they have more resources in the federal detention centers to to house him in an appropriate environment. Mr. Attorney, uh, yeah. yeah, we touched on this, but. How would you characterize the family's demeanor, and did they cooperate with your prosecution? Oh, yes. <clears throat> family, families have been great. Uh, you know, the, the families were obviously uh, upset that he came into the guilty plea with, an hair, with a haircut, um, you know, looking like a little boy. You know, they, the families, you know, felt that. That was a distortion. I think he means his family. I, I, I meant his oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. His family. Um, his family was not contacted by, by me at all. Um, his family. Um, I, I never spoke to his family at all. Um, uh, you know, his family was cooperative with, with you know with, with the investigation, from my understanding. But I never had any contact with them at all. Um, and I thought I have no idea what they're what they're feeling at all. Did that say anything to you that they did not discuss it? Before? No, because again, we, we, we typically don't talk to the defendant's family members um, in the sense, you know, during the proceedings. You know, we, you know they're talked to up front by investigators um, as far as the gathering of evidence and whether or not they had any, anything to share as far as evidence is concerned. But once that initial interview process takes place, the defendant's family is never really on our radar to talk to at all because, again, you know, they're, they're on the other side. He's represented by an attorney, um, and we do all communications through their attorney. To the best of your knowledge, were they at any of these proceedings for you? Um, no, no, they were not. They were not at any proceedings I'm aware of, and they were they were not there today. Uh, Claudine, yeah, Claudine. I just heard um, some of the families were saying how they don't believe he acted alone. Can you say? 100% I can say with 100% certainty, as I stand here now at 12 um, uh, 38 uh, on February 15, 2023, um, he acted alone. Now, again, if, if evidence, well, uh, everything can change. I mean, you know, you get more evidence in the future, something pops up, some witness comes forward and says, hey, oh, yeah, by the way, I talked to it the week before. Um, I highly doubt that. Um, because, uh, again, we've pretty much dotted our I's and crossed our T's, but is it possible, Claudine? Absolutely. Anything's possible. But as I stand here right now, uh, I have no evidence at all.
that tells me he had any help. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, you've been listening to Erie County District Attorney John Flynn, Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown, Police Commissioner Joe Gamalia, all addressing the media after this sentence to life in prison without the possibility of parole for Peyton Gendron. But what you heard from uh, the Erie County DA, John Flynn, was that today was justice with a lowercase j. The closure of one chapter, but the beginning of many more to be written. And for so many of these families, this justice was just another step forward in the legal process against this 19-year-old white supremacist who admitted guilt months ago, who live-streamed his killing spree on the internet. But for so many of these families, it didn't even really matter what happened today because it'll never bring back their family members. And some of the people inside the courtroom earlier today asked frankly, and rhetorically, perhaps, what's changed in the last nine months and one day since Peyton Gendron came to town on a targeted mission? And that's where the conversation has to lie. It has to lie within all of us to be that change, to meet the moment, and to determine the course of our future as a community. And I want to bring in Franchelle Parker, who is the executive director of Open Buffalo, to kind of dig into that. Because, Fran, you know, even listening to the mayor speak about that, you hear his sorrow and, you know, the moment that he felt that he may, might need to reach for a tissue. But there are so many more steps that need to be taken, both inside City Hall with lawmakers and the mayor himself to make real change in this community. So talk about that for us. Yeah, um, today, today we grieve. Um, some justice has been done, but I, um, I, was, I was really uh, Judge Egan's remarks in regards to um, how we address the systemic changes and the systemic changes in our community look like our leaders it looks like collaboration it looks like actually developing a system for investment and disinvestment communities um, so I, I think that that's that's just the beginning of the conversation but it's it's a start it's a start I would like to see um, one in, in an aggressive plan to address white supremacy and white nationalism in, in our community. Uh, I think that that is something that our elected officials can take the lead on. Um, today we grieve and I understand the emotions that we should feel those emotions. We should feel all of them so that this never happens again, but we can't just sit in our emotions. Nine months later, what has what has happened? What has changed in in our community? Um, so we we need to hold those um, in in power accountable. Um, those that are running our inst our public and private institutions, we need to hold them accountable. That we're not just talking about DEI strategies. Um, we're not just talking about where we're posting jobs, but that we're actually developing strategies to address systemic racism. Racism, and that means calling out and holding accountable those that are um, creating and um, holding systems of white supremacy in power in our community. You know, Franchelle, it's it's really interesting that you mentioned that because when we heard from Zanetta Everhart, and once again, her uh, son Zaire was shot and survived, he's dealing with survivor's guilt right now. But what she said was that racism and white supremacy are lifestyles that are chosen. Mm. And it struck me because this is something that we learn. It's not something that we come out feeling. This is education. And sometimes that education starts at the dinner table. For sure. Um, I, I think that we've, um, in, in America, we, we actually believe that race is a product of biology when it's not. Racism is a social construct. However, the impacts of racism are very real. So that means if we've actually created 
race, we can undo the impacts of racism. And to everyone's point, yes, it starts at the dinner table, but it doesn't just stop at the dinner table. It goes into the boardroom. Mm -hmm. It goes onto right. our news broadcast. It goes into our education system. When, when we see that black history and African-American history and civil rights are being banned in classrooms across the nation, that we're taking an active and an aggressive step in order to make sure that we're educating our young people, that we're educating our CEOs, we're educating at every level of these public and private systems. So it can't, it can't stop today. And I think today, hopefully, that we've been, um, that we're still grieving, but that healing looks like a collective response from lawmakers, from our decision makers, to actually aggressively attack, uh, aggressively tackle white supremacy. You, Fran, I was uh, speaking with Garnell Whitfield, whose mother Ruth, 86 years old, uh, there to buy seeds for her garden at Tops on May 14th, shot and killed by this white supremacist who apologized in court for what it's worth uh, for his actions and took responsibility for his actions. But Garnell was telling me yesterday when I spoke with him one on one that we need to stop just checking boxes, that we need to just stop throwing money at a car but there needs to be real actionable change when it comes to how we call it out, how we handle ourselves, and how we handle ourselves both in public and private. So I'm wondering, give me some solutions here. Give me some tangible ways to sit down tonight for a family perhaps watching this, for a CEO who uh, ha has a, an entire white staff. What should those people know? What are the conversation starters for those folks who are watching this, coming to terms with what happened nine months ago? Um, I, would, I would encourage um, anyone that's interested in diving deeper to reach out to organizations and community leaders that can help facilitate a conversation in the workplace. However, when, um, when you're sitting down um, for dinner this evening, just simply ask, how did you feel? This has been a lot on our community. What are you feeling in this moment? And just, just starting there, but starting the conversation. A lot of times, we'll, you know, we'll talk about something and then we'll move right on to, well, what do you think about the bill season next season, right? Um, stick with it, be consistent. Talk about the issues of race. Um, Buffalo did not get to the place that we're at by accident. It's decades of systemic disinvestment in the east side. It's decades of redlining, decades of issues with crime and lack of healthy food, the bare necessities that our communities deserve and need in order to actually thrive. Our communities have been denied access to those. Tonight, but tonight, just ask, just checking in with community members, checking in with your family members, and starting the conversation. Brian Talley is one of the men who spoke here today in front of Judge Susan Egan, expressing his sadness and his anger and simple disbelief that something like this could even happen in our community. It's uh, Geraldine Talley's sister-in-law. You, you didn't, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Geraldine Talley was his sister-in-law. You didn't hear from Mark Talley, who we've heard from so often uh, in the past because he's still so angry and still so upset at what happened on May 14th in Buffalo and, and didn't feel that it was time for him or didn't want to address Peyton Gendron. But what Brian Talley said to Peyton Gendron is that you came into the black community and you ripped us apart. How can you say you're sorry? He questioned. He said, you planned it. And I want you to listen to what he had to say in court today. That it's, it's painful. We'll never heal for this. Can you imagine you wake up on a Sunday morning and you're going shopping and you're going shopping on a graveyard? Because that's what Tops is now, it's a graveyard. Huh. It is a graveyard. Can you imagine going to buy your grocery at Forest Lawn, right in the middle of Forest Lawn right now? Well, that's what you did. And if you look at the community right now on Jefferson Avenue, 
after all the hype and everything, nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, it's got even worse. It's got even worse. Stores is closed down. The community is totally devastated. And you did this. Uh, Franchella, maybe you can dig in here for me. Has it actually gotten worse in the Jefferson Avenue community? We've seen, especially after the snowstorm, the blizzard, where 40 plus people were killed, so many of them in disenfranchised areas, killed by the weather. Has it gotten worse? I'll start on a positive note first. We we talked about um, we talked about Mark um, and not being president in the, in the courthouse. I I don't know what he's doing right now, but I know what he was doing last night, and he was organizing for community change because he reached out. And I I can't tell you what I would be doing if that was my mother. So I take inspiration from Mark and Zanetta to be on the front lines while they're still trying to heal. So I just want to lift that up, that out of this tragedy, we have superstar community advocates that are stepping up despite their own trauma, their own grief. Mm -hmm. um, however, I, I will say that international attention was paid to the city of Buffalo during that tragedy. And I too question what, what changes have actually happened. Um, we, we hear commitments of a billion dollars here, a million dollars there, but knock some doors in the Jefferson Avenue corridor and you ask the residents what has changed in their day-to-day -day lives. When the food distribution has stopped, when the organizations have gone away, what, ha what lasting change has, has happened in our community? And we everyday residents don't see it. We see it in a press release, we might see it at a press conference, but does it ever trickle down, so to speak, to actually change the everyday conditions? We, we still only have one grocery store in that surrounding neighborhood. Right. The same issues that existed before May, May 14th are still happening right here today. Um, so I, I say that this is now that we've gotten to a place where we see, um, I use the, the phrase small J justice, now that we see this, now it's time to move on and actually start to address the deep systemic disinvestment in east side communities um, to make sure that one, that the issues around May 14th never happened again, but that our communities actually start to thrive and we can get there. Yeah, we sure can. And, and you know, Franchello, I appreciate you and I appreciate your sentiments and the hard work that you and Open Buffalo are doing on Buffalo's east side. Uh, Christopher Braden was one of three people who survived this mass shooting on May 14th. He spent 10 days in the hospital. He had four surgeries and still has two more to go. He spoke today. He said he's a survivor. Nothing will stop how strong he is, how strong he's become. And he told the shooter himself, you haven't broken my spirit. Listen. I could speak for hours about my injuries and treatment, as well as the permanency of these injuries. The stress of not being able to return to work, the pain I suffered hospitalized that continues to this day. Uh, extensive rehab I have gone through. However, I would rather talk about being a survivor. I'm still the same person that I was before you did this to me. My scars and pain remind me of how strong I've become. I am more alive and stronger than ever. You haven't taken away my will to live. You haven't broken my spirit. The scars are a constant reminder of what happened to me, but don't define my future. Our future here in the city of Buffalo has to be better. Our future has to be bright, but that future starts by looking in the mirror and taking an inward approach at who we are as people, what we define ourselves by and who we define ourselves by surrounding ourselves with. But we have to be able to have those conversations and, and Taylor and Katie, after what we heard inside that courtroom today, these conversations are so vital, but we have to do them together. And we know that the Buffalo Strong spirit is there, but we have to be able to take it to the next level. At our community changed forever that day and today. We really got to see 
a lot of that change. We really got to see how far we've come. Maybe we haven't, we haven't come that far. We do need to still have these conversations. And we got to hear from people today that we haven't gotten the chance to hear from. So many of the people impacted, 13 people got to come up and mm -hmm. speak to the shooter directly. We heard from him for the first time today. Today was a huge day of firsts and, and the first step to moving forward. And I think perhaps if you haven't had those those conversations that you were talking about, if you haven't had those conversations with your families, your friends, now is the time. Let this be the impetus to have you start those conversations and begin that work at home. Now, as for what comes next in this process, yes, these state charges, now he's been sentenced on those state charges. He was given the sentence, which we knew was coming of life in prison. But tomorrow, again, this shooter will be in court as he is, again, facing federal charges as well. The DA saying earlier he does expect that he'll be transferred into federal custody tomorrow and that that case will then move forward. Of course, that is the case that does possibly carry the death penalty with it, Taylor. So we will, of course, continue to cover that. That's something we're going to keep covering, but we do want to thank our guests, Franchelle Parker and Chris Belling, for being here with us through this coverage as we continue these discussions and, and talk about what happened. Yes, thank you again for being with us and for being here for this sad, but also hopefully a moment of time that will move us forward as a community and better the Buffalo area. Of course, all of this information available for you right now on WKBW.com. We'll have the latest tonight at 5 and 6. Thank you for joining us.